All right, so, so Tom sent the SOS distress call out because when I was here two weeks ago, all these buds were looking beautiful and, uh, <laughs> and not so much anymore. So we called our IPM specialist, Saul in to uh, come help us out. So yeah, and everything kind of went south very quickly. Mm -hmm. I went away for literally overnight to go visit a grow in uh, Las Vegas, got back, and noticed right away the next morning that there was something wrong. Mm -hmm. And there, I, don't, I didn't know what it was, and it, and, um, it, it, it was then oh uh, quickly God. rampant. It, it, let, let me tell you, Tom, br bring the camera over here. We'll, we'll tell you exactly what it is. And this is what, remember what I grabbed last time, that one caterpillar? So look. I, yeah, you can come over here and see his buddy over see here. Him? Wait, Tom, first look, do you see this one? What's that? Right there. Right there. Right. And then his buddy's hanging out over there. Where's the other one? Or <laughs> of the many? Right here. Oh, wow. That one's huge. Yeah. Tom, that one is a fat caterpillar that's, <laughs> that's gorging itself. And then the other clear uh, sign, there are turds everywhere. Um, just look around and you'll see them there. Um, as they feed, they just put their drop. Oh yeah, those little black, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you can see them on many of the buds. So what is this that we're looking at? What are, the, what are these? Uh, we're just looking at some caterpillar, caterpillar signs and symptoms. Okay. Um, here's some more. It's uh, very it's likely there, there would be chewing damage. Yeah. Um, but you can see it <laughs> basically <laughs> where, we, where we see our, our foe over here. Okay, where is this guy? Where did he go? Where did he go? Um, I thought he was up here. He's been roaming around here. He's been laying his turds oh, yeah, right, right here, there. Right here, right yeah. here, right here. Right and there. he's been chewing everything here. You see all that chewing damage? Does it take just one to do all this damage? You, I've, I've seen two in a bud, yeah. But um, when you see this damage, it's not long before you find him if you just start looking for him. So you, go, you look for this here. Looks like chewing damage. And then you look for their turds, right? We already saw what those look like. Um, you see that, they're not far. It is a great picture of a, of a caterpillar feces right there. Right where, exactly. And that leaf right there, really, oh, that's wow. what that is. Yeah. Let me get this huge guy. Where's the huge one? Here's some more feces. There, looks like it. Do you this. see him? Look at that. This guy has his head buried into the, uh, right into the middle of the, of the bud. Here's something to shoot at. Um, Which one? Their feces isn't always dark brown. Dark brown. There's some lighter colors too. Okay, so let me take a and, picture. And so, then so dark I'm, down here too. You see that? All this. You see these? All that right there? All the dark stuff? It doesn't all have stuff? to be dark brown. Huh? They're, they're sometimes almost orange or even yellow, yellowish brown. <clears throat> Some fresh poo, as, violent as my daughter tells me. Yeah, chewing damage, poop. Look around and you'll find them. And it's, it's important to, as soon as you see them, um, oh, look here, look here, here's what I meant. That's two different colors, oh, look at broad that. colors so of um, feces right there. Oh, okay, right there. so let me take a picture of that. Yeah. Wow. And they're dry, they look like. Yeah, so that, dry it can range, it can range anywhere between those, right, those colors there. Here's a bunch more right here. It actually looks like pellets. Wow. Yeah. Easiest way. Were. I saw them, but I didn't know what they were. Yeah, I mean, look Easiest at this. way to distinguish. Um, see, I, I don't know if you can see that. Here, come over here. Easiest way to distinguish between slugs or snails and caterpillars because they do a lot of similar chewing. Oh, so the feces is the. Feces is, the, is caterpillar and slime trails is slugs and snails. Can you see that? Perfect. That's awesome. I hope I can get that from you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so so is that pretty much the main problem we have going on here? I mean, do you see other? Um, well, actually, these are all, this is all poop everywhere, right? Yeah, yes. it's, it's uh, it looks like bud rot, right? Yeah, um, that's 
did you one question to ask is what was the weather like before you left was uh, it overcast and kind of muggy or not particularly it was uh you know out here it hit, hit the, what, the 117 it was super hot okay. a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. super wonder, hot yeah yeah and uh just a few miles from here it hit the 121 in mm -hmm. woodland hills so yeah we did have you know and yesterday it was 105 mm -hmm. 10 you know so it's been triple digits and but that was extreme heat and uh shortly before Good i God. left mm -hmm. Uh, the praying mantis have been slacking. <laughs> I mean, I assume they, they would chow on the would caterpillars. They? they would, yeah, if they're oh, big because enough. Because I've been so, I mean, I they're have big to enough. tell you, I mm -hmm. did get a little complacent because I had like two praying mantises in here. They were all over. So it's I mean, interesting because when we were here uh, two weeks ago, I saw a caterpillar and I we, killed it. You took it, it off? Yikes. I and found then, one the other day. I took it off, but I didn't. I obviously missed so, so well, some of some of this here, could come, be come around this side because the camera's right there. So some of this could be partly because of the caterpillar, right? Um, so bud rot or gray mold is botrytis cinerea. Um, it's a fungus that affects all kinds of different plants, um, strawberries and grapes being other big crops that it's actually a big problem. Um, and usually it's something that appears or shows itself once you've got ripe fruit, or in this case, ripe flowers, right? Um, they have, you know, been growing and their sugar content's high. Um, and uh, that's exactly what botrytis can grow on. Um, but uh, but it's, a, it's a disease and that's, that's not all, um, well, I was getting at the caterpillars will wound the tissue and spores find it easier to get into the plant tissue and, and germinate, right? right? So that's a very common cause of, of bud rot. And so, so they're almost symbiotic in a bad way. Yes, they're I mean- They're creating the environment for the, for the yeah. bud rot. To... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so. So you're seeing bud rot and caterpillar damage. You're seeing both. I'm seeing, yeah. Well, okay. I mean, it's tough to see the caterpillar damage on the buds themselves because it's just a hole you can't really right. see. Sure. You can pull that guy out and you can see that. Um, you'll see the whole. Can we hole. get rid of this big one? No. Let me. Uh, do you have a knife or something to? What about that? Uh... Here, hold this. Yeah. Tom goes into his toolkit. Well, what about the uh, scissors? Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Want to show you something I see here on something too. To focus. I don't know if yeah. uh, I don't know if I could go back in time here, but. Tom, did you cut a piece of these flowers off right here? It looks like you, uh, uh yes, after, you did, huh? Yeah. Is that where you first saw it? Uh, probably or on this plant. Look, look, look through the viewfinder when you're talking. Mm, yeah. <laughs> that was the one thing I noticed from the Steve Cantwell video. Is like I'm, Steve, I'm, Stevie I'm, Wonder on the I'm camera. I'm mic'd up. No, 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 I'm saying, but you're, you're oh, like, it went you're off like, a little bit. <laughs> you're like, you're like holding it over here, talking. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So here. So you found two two specks of it here, right? Yes. And then you came in with a knife. Well, the thing is, is so that yeah, it got right brown there. and it pulled right off. It pulled right off. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, bud was already in, infected. Right. right? So exactly. some people are of the mind, cut it if I'm close to harvest and I can keep what's below. Some are of the mind, you know, cut it down low, right. eliminate another source of the spore, especially right. if you're early, right. like you are now, you know, so early, well, you were. Um, right. I and, tried early on, but I realized, I mean, it happened so fast, uh, within uh, literally a, a day. I, I know, within a Be day. the viewfinder. That, yeah. um, that it was out of my, out of control. Yeah. I, I didn't know what to do. Because oh, it was, it's, it's quick. Yeah, it's it quick. very I've fast. Seen, yeah, it's like with any disease. I mean, um, so you guys. I guess my question is, for something, this is obviously not a large grow. If you do see it, mm -hmm. what do you do? Uh, so what do you do when you see it? Basically I can do is what, what we call roguing. You know, you remove tissue. That's about what you can do. Uh, if you find a caterpillar in here, you're going to look down below. You see all these turds that drop down on all these buds below. Could have been, he was just feeding up here. looks like he was feeding up here, but all these, all that feces that dropped onto these very ripe flowers, and then given the right conditions, 
those contain spores too. I mean, if he had been feeding on them. Not that, not just that, you know, they begin to decompose. The tissue around where they landed also begins to decompose. It's usually that combination of like something wet and the caterpillar feces, and then it, it blows up. So get rid of that cola. And if that's where it started and do a major so search can we do this them. so looking because obviously those are in much worse these have um sort of been trying yeah to maintain themselves so are these too hmm. far gone honestly or you um do? yeah you can still save this for extract um there's you know you'll get some extract there but uh Come but get in side. there every hour right, that st passes. St st stand right there. Every hour that passes is lower yield, right? Right. Because you're not going to get much out of these dried up, uh, you know. Sections. Yeah, pieces of flour. So basically, if you start noticing it, it's almost like you want to chop early to save what you have. It may not be perfect, but. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you could afford to, you could, um, like what, what we would do, um, where I, where I um, managed IPM is, you know, the, it was kind of susceptible, uh, strains were susceptible to this, this fungus. So uh -huh. you'd start seeing it blowing up on um, a particular, particularly sensitive strain. Um, you would, uh, right, so I'm gonna take a picture you of might this. harvest that early for, you know, this. for fresh frozen. So yeah. say you haven't seen any of the bud rot, um, but you've seen a couple of the caterpillars. Um, what, is there pest management we can do to, to sort of, uh, keep these caterpillars away? oh yeah yeah there's there are lots of strategies um, uh, the caterpillar at this stage that we saw there there's not much else other than picking them off um, because the materials that you might use at that advanced stage aren't allowed in California cannabis right which so, are what um, the substances they're natural substances called spinosads um, number of products have them it's a stomach neurotoxin for uh for insects the insect chews on plant material that's been sprayed with it and it it, uh, it basically po poisons itself right so that's something you'd want to do during veg when it's no yeah yeah i mean you would you can't though it's not oh, it's so not it's totally illegal it's not, it's not at all stages of so um the other you know this is uh, now, this this could be done. This could also... be done when it's just starting. Let's put it that way. Okay. And if and if you see big caterpillars, you're not going to get them with the other strategies. The only spray strategy you might have with a big caterpillar is to spray spinosads, which we can't. And that's kind of the question that Tom was asking: is what can we do at this stage well, when you well, found actually, a caterpillar? Um, what about if you first see a caterpillar? Yeah. So that the stage? Yeah. that's your that's where the answer lies. Okay. Okay. Is um, if any of you heard the other uh video or streaming that we stream that we did um you probably you probably recognize that i'm big on monitoring right so you need to know what caterpillars and their adults look like and when they're present as soon as possible so that usually comes in 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 catching the flying adults right so males and females will meet up with each other um, they'll fly male will you know mate with the female female will go off and lay eggs, <laughs> right? So if you're, if so you're good about monitoring store. for moths, right? You catch that before all that exchange has gone on, right? Right. So, Look um, at that. And then what? Like you, you might, so you see them, how do you prevent those, them from laying their eggs on So you, you, you trap, right? Um, there's very little you can, you can do to like reduce their numbers. Um, but it's really important at that point to identify the species that you've got. Right, and it's hard to do it from looking at the moths. So, for instance, that one is. Uh, do you see it? That one looks yeah. like it's like the corn earworm, right? So, would this be like like the white moth that I see flying around oh, everywhere? Geez, is that what? It, it, I, I think it is a white moth. I'm really bad at uh, moths and butterflies, but um, yeah, I think it is. It's, like it's not like a monarch butterfly. Oh no, wait, it is, and it's a brown. Sorry, it's Helicoverpa zea, and I think it's a brown one. Um, Let me, uh, so I have a question, like looking up here at, at all of these up here, mm -hmm. um, did the, were the caterpillars hitting each one of these or is there, no, is there a I disease don't, I don't in the think plant? so. I don't think so. If yeah. this is, you know, botrytis, it does look very dried up and then yeah. usually it's, 
you know, there's something going on within the plant. Usually, yeah, the, the botrytis has actually entered the plant. Okay. Not not the whole plant, but the tissue, the tissue that's affected. Yeah, the tissue. Now maybe um, the botrytis flared up on you because of some some climate event, like some heat humidity or something that happened. Yeah, but yeah. then after the heat, this is this could be why you got all this quick browning, yeah. you know, because the tissue was awesome. dead already. Yeah. Um, you just probably weren't aware of, of the symptoms. I, I mean, see. we'd have to we'd have to break some of these buds open so that you could see what, although there is a lot of caterpillar damage. So a lot of this could have been from them. Yeah. So this was not just caterpillars, although, geez, I'm finding Lots of feces? <laughs> yeah, and I didn't think that one should have had any. Yeah. So basically you're seeing a one-two punch of botrytis and caterpillar. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a disease that... Here's, here's this for you, another seed. Thank you. Um, What's that? A seed. Nice! Yeah, so there's a disease and then there's... I guess effectively what you might call it the vector, although it's not really a vector, it's there's what's causing a, a, a susceptibility to the plant and then it's the, the caterpillars injuring it. Yeah. Right? But back to monitoring, if, yeah. you, if you can ID moths, those are gonna come in earlier, right? Yeah. So moths are hard to control. There are strategies, but um, they're very difficult for the ones that are normally attacking cannabis. Um, but that could be the trigger for certain applications. For example, the, the um, BTI, have you heard of BTI? Bacillus thuringiensis. Good idea. Also, let's, um, there's these plants over here while you're talking. All right. I've got a few more. Yeah, you see. Uh, you're getting it here. It's, star <laughs> it's just Pretty starting. Bad. Yeah. And here you don't see the chewing damage. No, I can't. I can't. There might be some here, but I doubt it. Although I'm seeing feces right here. That looks like feces. I would say a good chunk of it is because of that feeding. I mean, these, they seem to be in a lot of your buds, like right there. So there was a caterpillar here at one point feeding. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It, it, it's possible it's, it's a primary reason, huh? I mean, I've not seen, I can't find them either. That's the other part. Yeah, that's caterpillars. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, there's quite a bit. If you look in here, um, that's a clean flower right there, right? More yeah. or less. Yeah. But it's just been completely shot on. Um, and yeah, so any humidity change, any injury, just the fact that you have a little fermenting um, little compost pile of caterpillar turds on tissue that's already well advanced and nearly ripe close to harvest you know it's it's setting yourself up for another site where where the fungus can blow up on you right right and then the spores from this plant here looks like this cola up here you cut back too right yeah you took it you chopped this one off too when you first saw it yeah 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 see, so he started up, uh, it started up here, can send it that way. You have more injuries or really soft tissue and then you get the right weather conditions and now you've spread it that way. Um, it sounds like once it's, it's spreading, it's kind of hard to... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very difficult. Um, there's really... Um, <laughs> I mean, this one looks actually... Well, no, there's the bud rot. Yeah. yeah. The top cola. And what's interesting, what we've been finding a lot of is almost every diseased even the the kind of the less diseased buds are, are covered in caterpillar feces so i, I at this point i, I might say it, it's the main reason i mean it, it's any flower that's got any so you, you know, think the caterpillar just overwhelmed it and then the betrayal the just weird part is I, we only found those two but that was a quick glance and um yeah, it's a. Uh, That's what I'm saying. I mean, okay. I've been out here so, every day looking yeah. for caterpillars. It's tough so so to find them. You I saw mean, they're green. To me, uh, this is like a, to look for. It's like a grow where you only have a couple plants. They're not like all bunched up. It's not hot and humid and you know, mean, air circulation. You know, there's 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 also strain susceptibility. So, 
Are you are you aware with the disease of uh, the disease triangle? Have you heard of that before? It's this concept that was developed um, uh, related to disease um, in plants, but it's the same for humans. Um, disease disease triangle consists of. It's a way to explain how disease happens, how it proceeds, and how it can damage you economically. Right. Um, there's three components to it. The first component is the presence of whatever pathogen. So come what? The, come out of the heat. Come out yeah, of the Good sun. idea. Yeah. <laughs> whatever pathogen we're talking about, right? right? In this case, it would be actually botrytis scenario, right? Um, spores could be the presence, um, but there's also what are called sclerotia, and that's it. Uh, near the end of the season, it goes into a sort of like a hibernation type you know, suspended animation. Uh, basically, it's a survival structure. And then that structure can stay in the area and once again germinate in the right conditions when there's on, in the next crop, you know what I mean? It can survive on plant debris. Right. It can survive on rich soil. I mean, it can survive in rich soil. Um, so it's just waiting there um, to germinate again. So the presence is, is uh, one of those components of the disease triangle. Um, obviously, um, then there's the susceptible host, right? So th that's where I was getting here. Um, this is obviously a susceptible host. It's a problem in all cannabis production. Uh, grape, grapes also, it's a problem in many you know, vineyards. Um, uh, in strawberries, it's also a problem in, in strawberries. So we're talking about hosts that will can be parasitized by the fungus, right? And, um, and yeah, um, if we think about it, we've got different susceptibilities, right? Um, there's a, the, in the vineyards, for example, there are a couple of grapes that are very thin skinned varieties um, that are much more susceptible to the botrytis bunch, they call it bunch rot in vineyards versus a loose, uh, versus a hard skin grape, right? That has, you know, tight, tight little berries. They're less susceptible. Um, they're not, it's not as easy for the fungus to penetrate the tissue. Um, so varietal differences in grapes make a, make a difference. Well, guess what? They also do in cannabis. I don't know what strains you have here, but uh, if you have those susceptible strains, you you can see the difference between you know five percent in one strain let's say and thirty percent in another strain yeah. right so strain is big um, we still don't understand that very well um we implore cannabis growers to take notes so are there certain pests like you say even just for a small home grow like this that i might want to keep around to sort of counteract the butterflies or the yeah let me get to that so <laughs> The last component of the disease triangle is actually um, the environmental conditions for the disease to infect, right? Um, and basically the concept of this dis disease triangle is you have to have all three of those components present in order to have disease or have disease that's economically, you know, problematic, right? Um, if you can break with one, if you can control one, you can control the disease, right? right? So if, you had, if we had a, a cannabis strain that was not susceptible to, um, to, you know, to, this, uh, to the fungus, 0% susceptibility, and you grew only that, guess what? You broke that triangle there, you, you eliminated a susceptible host, right? Um, another part of susceptibility, we talked about it, the chewing damage caused on the, on, the, uh, on the flower being an, uh, a, a, an area where the fungus can infect and get to the tissues easily and quickly and feed on it and sporulate and pretty soon destroy that bud, right? So if you don't have that damage, then you've, not, you've made it less susceptible, right. whatever host it is. So you can see how you can focus on these right. areas. So the big one for botrytis, honestly, is, is uh, environment. Um, environment is uh, by far the largest, uh, the most important part of that disease uh, triangle. But so, I mean, how would you evaluate this environment? That doesn't look too tight. Let's put it that way. But what I mean by that is, fungus likes humidity. Yeah. Fungus like 
likes a certain range of temperature. Right. If you grow plants too tight, uh, too, their Most canopies are too, yeah, you're not, you won't allow for airflow, right? Um, we were talking about botrytis and grapes. Um, the, the two susceptible grapes that I, that I was talking about, the thin-skinned ones, also have very, very tight bunches, right? So if a spore gets in there, there's no way to change the environment in that cluster to be other than just humid and dark, right? And when the grapes get sweet, now it's got food, right? So you've, you've got this strain that's got a tight, tight uh, uh, cluster formation, whereas a loose one, like you see in table grapes, you know how you, you, you can see every grape inside the cluster on table grapes? So even, Not as susceptible. Even if these plants had been uh, farther apart, they still, the nature of these plants was the large leaves, they were growing abundantly, yeah, yeah. leaving a lot of shade underneath, and probably still a lot of opportunity for uh, the bugs to mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. be comfortable. I mean, it, I've not seen this before where every bud seems to have some feces, so a big, I think a big part of it must have been the caterpillars. Um, but, but uh, I mean, again, what strain is this? Do you have, do you have so a So this is like, a, um, uh, what's the high CBD strain? It's, it's a high CBD cross by, with an alien uh, fire. Um, so we know even like less. It's like harlequin. We know even less about CBD. But, but what's interesting is the, these, wow. are, these are two different cultivars. So all these over here are one, but those are all autos that are totally different. Mm -hmm. And this, this one that over here that was simply destroyed, yeah, this that, plant, that, one that was an auto. <clears throat> okay. Now these here are newer ones, and they, okay. they haven't been quite uh, in, affected yet. These are our younger plants. This one, however... You're not, yeah. this, that's probably not going to go very far. Yeah. And you've already got it there. That won't go very far, I think. And I think I can see in here the caterpillar <laughs> turds. Well, never mind. Yeah. Yeah, you've got quite a bit of feces down here. So, and you got quite a bit right there. So, wow. Well, how about this? Okay, so what, what keeps the caterpillars back? What's our. Yeah, so, okay, well, I wanted to, wanted to talk about that disease triangle just because, you know, then you see the there. impact of the, of the caterpillar, right? It's making yeah. the host more susceptible. Here, sit, right? Sit, sit on the couch. So, obviously, uh, dis destroying that particular component of the disease triangle is. Uh, you know, is going to be helpful to, to yeah. ending the disease or yeah. keeping it from hurting you economically, right? So what's the strategy? Well, we talked about monitoring. That's the foundation, all right? You want to know as early as possible, right? You have, a, you have an insect who's going to lay eggs, they're going to hatch, or we're going to want to feed. You've got some time before that happens to, to put in some control out, um, action for, for Caterpillar. Um, so fastest the, the earliest sign would be when the adults are flying into your grow right um, so monitoring for the moths is super key right it's it, it's very very important um, there's a lot of ways to monitor for the moths but when you see them you can begin initiating um, actions that don't even require for the larva to be out and about yet right such as um, you can be, you can start your Bacillus thuringiensis. I was saying BTI. Um, it's a another. It's a bacteria that, um, when the caterpillar feeds on it, it grows in its stomachs and its stomach and it. Um, so, so would that be like a foliar spray or it's something? It's a foliar or? spray. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you'd put it what like in water and. and yeah, it would be a, a foliar spray, right? Is, you see, you why, see the moths. Why wouldn't I have used that? I mean, why wouldn't someone just use that anyway as a precautionary measure? Well, you know, there's philosophies about not wanting to spray for an, any number of reasons, okay. right? Um, you know, there's 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 disease and there's potential for burn and then there's there's expense. You know, right. every spray is labor and material. Right, so there are a number of reasons why not to, but you make a very good point. Um, this, this particular bacteria is specific to caterpillars. It really doesn't, it doesn't really hurt any other insect or any other animal. So it's pretty so, safe. So even for other the plant. leaf eaters, like an aphid, yeah. wouldn't really mm -hmm. be affected by it. That's interesting. No, not at all. Mm. Um, it's, it's specific. It's a, it's, I guess you could call it a disease. It's, it's a disease specific for caterpillars. Well, for me in particular, knowing that I really have a caterpillar problem back in this <laughs> they, yard, it might they love make Tom's sense. Yard. Maybe yeah. it's all the dog poo that's all <laughs> And you can grass. decide, you know, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, we're, um, I've been working with some um, 
cold crop growers in Salinas, and right now Salinas and other Did parts of the country. Did you say cold crop? Cold crops, like uh, cabbage, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, the Salinas is going through um, a big problem with diamondback moth. Um, and they're using these sprays for the caterpillars, and some of the growers have sprayed, geez, um, like a dozen times, you know, where they would have only done three sprays in, the, in, in, er, in previous years. And it's just this real big problem. And there will be years where certain caterpillars are going to be more problematic than others. But you're right. If, uh, if you kept up on it early enough, um, you can put those sprays out. And what's important to know about those sprays is the caterpillar has to feed on them. But once the caterpillar is advanced, in other words, far along on its development, one of the later larval stages, they're not, they're not as susceptible anymore to it. So like our friend right here would be an example of late larval He would larval probably, stage. yeah, he would just, he would eat the, the BTI. Gemma, um, can you be our caterpillar model? Can you show, can you just put your hand mm -hmm. out? Thank you. Yeah, he would eat the BTI and then just uh, <laughs> poop it out. give you the finger. After that you is out. some caterpillar. Okay, right. so, so, all right, so early, so there aren't like. Okay, so what know, else, what other, for example, uh, what like, else can you do so, to, so, to the moths? So uh, when yeah. the caterpillar's young mm -hmm. and it feeds on this stuff, that's when it gets them. Okay. So you, yeah. if you can put that stuff out right about so, when so, they're hatching. So, so I saw, I, yeah, we saw some pretty small caterpillars about two weeks ago. So that would imply that would have like, been it. You could apply like could've... four weeks ago. We should have sprayed. If you had, if you had known, right, the week before that had and had eagle, started your spray. If Tom had some eagle eyes on the. Uh, well, well, we saw them. I just didn't. I would have done all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's, I didn't know. Tom was it's, feeding it's, them. It's, it's <laughs> learning. I mean, instead of instead of yeah, killing. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> you were feeding them <laughs> um but yeah you know that's that strategy I, it, there's more good to it than bad um yeah. the usually the formulations for that bacteria aren't really dangerous in sprays so they're very safe sprays and you know if you're doing it everything the right way um and you get those on early enough and you can't just do it once and expect it to to work you know you've got to come back at whatever the label recommends and and uh just just know, I, I can't find the eggs. I don't know where the tiny larvae are. They're really difficult to find. They're green. They're smaller than, uh, than most of the leaves. So you're not gonna find them always. They're, th they're in there, they're chewing. If they chew on this, if they just happen to chew on a leaf that I sprayed with this, then they're toast. And right. control can be achieved. Now, before that, that part, like keeping, like even trying to do something so that you don't have to spray, would that be just limited to like trapping the moths or cause I'm outside Mass here. trapping for, yeah. mass trapping for, um, for moths is, is really that I know of not a really good strategy okay. for control. I, cause I they can fly so. in from every, everywhere. Sure. But if you want to dive in a little deep, um, there are pheromones and you know what pheromones are, right? They're what males or females emit to attract the other sex for mating. Um, there are some, um, all moths, this is how uh, females attract males through pheromones, right? And they, 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 they could be miles away even, and the male can pick up the scent, right? Um, well, for some, of the, some moths, not many, and actually none yet that I know of that, that hits the, the cannabis plant, but, but, you know, we never know when one of these moths that I'm talking about will start hitting us. Um, we've been, uh, well, um, scientists, uh, you know, have been able to uh, synthesize these pheromones in the lab. And then you can use something that's called uh, mating disruption. So if you take the synthesized pheromone, you put it in your farm, um, you put it, you know, you distribute it through your farm and you have this huge cloud of pheromone, like a, like a million or a, like a trillion females are in that field. Um, Which would attract all the males. It'll attack, attract the males, but the strategy is, where is she? He's blind. And there's this huge cloud that he uses himself to guide himself directly to where she is. Oh, so so if there are females, you the his radar is everywhere, and he can't find the female, so he can't mate. Yep, Got that's it. called mating disruption. Because where I thought you were going is like you know when I was growing up, we always had beetle traps where you have the pheromones too, which attract right. them, and they go into the trap that they yeah, can't yeah. get out of, and you have a it's, thousand in there the next day. There are some some pests where that really works effectively. I thought you were going where well, you'd put the mer uh, pheromones near a pigeon and then so they'll start mating with pigeons. And, you know, <laughs> in interspecies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, anyway. Um, where'd you put it? But yeah, but okay, like I said, around. as I said, there's, 
there aren't very many the, no, species no, no, where we have these pheromones for. Um, we do have a few. I know um, I used to battle light brown apple moth in, in herbs, um, and there happened to be a mating disruption pheromone, and that's exactly one of the arms of the strategy we used, um, as, as well as the, the BT sprays. Well, it sounds to I, me Well, like, let me ask this. Ha, yeah. have, have you seen something of this decimation scale in a, in a commercial grow recently? Mm -mm. Okay, um, so the so odd part is, is I can't find the caterpillars but I can see all their feces in there. So they're crafty. It's, it's about looking. I'm sure there's more. I mean, it took me about, what, two minutes to find two of them, right? Gemma, can you really go find at. us some more caterpillars? Yeah. <laughs> look, look in the fluffy flowers. Yeah, so again, I don't <laughs> think mating disruption is a good strategy for cannabis because we just don't have, you know, we, we barely know which caterpillars are going to hurt us. And the ones that are hitting us, I don't believe we have Maiden disruption. So oh, you've sorry, got. Is that pheromone applicable to all different butterflies no. and moths, or like yeah. only one species? Species specific. Uh, so you need it's not like even, eight It's not even different... family specific. You know, like insects have families. Uh, so, it's hyper, and so, so you'd really need to know which one is infecting your plants. So like that was corn earworm, right? Mm. Um, but what's the strategy there? Okay, well, um, th there's nothing specific for corn earworm. Uh, um, but, no. but we'll get to the biocontrol. Oh, so. Okay. So, so the pheromone wouldn't work for corn earworm, but the BT toxin would work. Right. right? Um, what else is available? Then you can talk about, you know, um, macro, you know, predators right. beyond just the bacteria. That's a micro predator, right? It's a parasite of the, of the caterpillar. Right. Um, there are um, what are called uh, what, um, the parasitic wasp, the, uh, the okay. trichogramma wasps. Yeah. Have you heard of these? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Um, wasps are really interesting um, order of insects in that they're very commonly parasitic. Their lifestyle is, is parasitic. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the tarantula hawk and yeah. how it, it'll inject its eggs into a tarantula and then the, eggs, the larva will eat the tarantula from inside out, new adult hatches, right? right. Or emerges, <laughs> right? right? Um, there happen to be small teeny wasps the, yeah, they're the actually tiny, right? They're they're very very tiny. The same thing with... Uh... Yeah, except, except that they inject their eggs into the moth's eggs. So they'll search for and find the cluster of eggs or the individual eggs and inject their egg. And then during the development, the larva so will kill you it. Want, so say you were going to do a wasp treatment, you would want to do that at, um, yes. when you have the food available for them. When you've got, it's, they're not eating, right? They're not oh, feeding Oh, yeah, no, them. no, yeah, it's, right. not a, it's not food. Yeah. But yeah, they're putting their eggs, they're yeah. putting their eggs in them. Yeah, um, so you need to have no, the eggs available. No, why wait? Why well, wait? Okay. Have them, have them there. So they will, right? so if you, if you bring the wasp in, they're not going to go away? They're going to stick around? Oh, they will go away. Yeah, so that's the thing is, you know, they will be, they will search for caterpillar eggs. And then if they find a, a hornworm egg and it happens to be one of the ones that species that likes hornworm there in your, uh, in your tomatoes, then they might just fly over there and, and work on that and then eventually get distracted and go look. Um, but that's the whole point with monitoring. Let's say you spot the adult, right. you, you know how to identify the corn earworm adult, right? right? That's when you start your BT sprays, but you also start your wasp releases. Okay. And you so, keep, and you okay. Do, so and you we do would, we would like yeah. you guys breed parasitic wasps. Mm -hmm. So we would bring a container, and Tom would what, like just put it like at the at there's, the base of the. There's a couple options. There's um, there's loose eggs mm. that you can put, and they're not eggs actually. They're pupa. Mm. Um, they are the eggs of another moth, right? That was that have have a moth well, developed. What I about mean, all uh, the feces? The, the, can you tell from the feces what we're dealing with? <sighs> it's hard. It's really difficult. Yeah. Um, you mean like which caterpillar? Yeah. I mean, small feces might mean a small species of caterpillar, but it could also mean a larval, a younger larval stage of a okay. big species of caterpillar, gotcha. right? Whatever. Right. Um, but no, the, the way to do it, and it's even difficult, <laughs> it's even difficult collecting um, the, you know, when you collect the individual um, caterpillars, because, you know, they go through numerous stages. Mm. They molt through their life stages, so, um, and they don't look identical. Um, I have a slide on a presentation yeah, yeah, yeah. which has um, five different looking caterpillars and I ask people, how many caterpillars do you see here? They say five. I say, no, that's the same one. It's just different larval yeah. stages. So you, you got to kind of, at, at some point, you got to 
sometimes have to rely on an expert with the so common you, so ones. So yeah, you not only do you need to monitor, but you need to be uh, IDM an, an yeah. entomologist. Because here's the thing is, those wasps, there are different species of those sure. wasps, and like we rear three, right? Sure. They tend to target different species of moths. So if you release the wrong one, you might as well not be releasing at all. No doubt. Right? So you got to know not just which ones you have, but which other ones, you know, you may have more than one caterpillar. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so the so challenges and, and are huge. And each parasitic wasp uh -huh. only focuses, targets one type of caterpillar egg? No, they, they do cross over to different okay. things. It's just, it's just the research has shown that this particular wasp can, can control this particular caterpillar in these crops, whereas this one can't. Even though it may on occasion inject its larva, maybe it's not a preferred choice for it, or maybe just didn't evolve on that partic particular caterpillar and the egg is not viable and, or the larva dies. You know, it's just almost, you know, the research had, to, there had to be a lot of research and you'll often see where these trichogramma wasps will all target one species, but there may be one that's really good at controlling it, all right? So that's why you want to know what you got. Who are they? What's, where, when did they come and, and who are they? And you can distinguish caterpillars not just by their appearance, but their moths. So if you're catching a big uh, dark moth and you're also catching this little tiny yellow moth, uh, that's two species. Right. Well, so, that was going to be my question. Do you think Tom has multiple species well, of... We only saw that, that, that corn earworm, but uh, I didn't... But we saw two of them. We saw there's Yeah, they're the, okay. um, so we the saw same this, species. Though. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, so possibly there's another one, but it could just be... It could be, species. but we haven't found it. Right. right? So, yeah, there could be. Okay, I, although so it's not... So, so the corn ear species, is there a specific parasitic wasp species that... Loves yeah, corn yeah, ears. yeah, yeah. There's, uh, you know, the trichogrammas. Like I said, I, um, I can give you more details on a list of, you know, we have three species of trichogramma, of a list of what, which ones they tend to prefer and can't have been shown to control. Um, so next season we would be, <laughs> we we'd bring those out early. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. It's always just um, preventative. I like. mean, I, I'm. Uh, I, I focus on biological control, right? I've been doing pest management now for six years um, um, in different, different crops, right? several different crops. Um, but the, the bulk of those years have, have been um, putting together what, what are called biointensive IPM programs. Basically, they're founded on, on the idea that we're going to try to control our pests and diseases with biological agents that, such okay, as so that you that okay continue but such as bt that's yeah. a bacteria um and these wasps they're also they're, they're also they're insects right um and there are other predators of caterpillars too so that, so basically, kind of so basically anything that's living that would attack the thing you don't yes, want whether yeah. it's so, a bacteria a fungus yeah. another yeah, yeah. bug what yeah. about the versus soil a pesticide? biology i mean can do does it begin there um I mean, s s soil, I mean, that, that's where everything starts, right? Um, you know, the um, plants evolved in soil, right? So, and we know that nutrition and um, the right kind of soil but we'll but so, but something like a caterpillar would love to eat a super healthy plant. Well, that's what you know. Yeah, these these flowers were were so yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Caterpillars. It's a tough one to say that the soil soil pl plays a big big part of it. But you know, you have good soil, you can have a healthy plant with better defenses to fight off certain things like the botrytis. Let's say you had a flower that was grown in very good soil, you know, and by good, it's a broad definition of what we mean by good, which includes microbiota, right? But we're talking also struct structure of the soil and, you know, um, the food and um, as well as the microbiology going on there. But any number of these things that can strengthen the plant, one of the ways that the plant is strengthened is by its tissues, uh, its, its cell walls thickening, you know, and what's that mean? That means it's a lot tougher for a disease to, to injure, to actually, some of these diseases actually send what are called, these fungal diseases send what's called an apressoria, which is like a drill 
and they'll drill right into tissue, um, into the cell t cells of the plant. Well, if to they like hold on to and just suck to, to get in out. and start and then start Sucking proliferating nutrients. inside of it, right? They don't even need an opening for them. But uh, you know, if you have uh, tissue that's that's more, you know, that's that's tougher, right? Because you took care of giving it absolute perfect soil conditions, then you have some level of there's less susceptibility, right? And so you've weakened that one component of the susceptible sure, host, sure right? Sure, makes sense to me. Yeah. I'm a little disappointed because that was what this was all about, was, you know, <laughs> our, yeah. our attempt to really, you know, yeah. well, build really I, I strong think plants. A, and well, again, this gets back to my yeah. question with caterpillars. Like, I, don't, I think a super healthy plant, a caterpillar would love to eat. Yeah, sure. And, and at that point, you're, you know, you're talking it, um, the... the, the the these thickness. things you remember these things looked amazing two weeks ago they were just like Poof. yeah that's why um, that's why botrytis and, and caterpillars are are a bane in outdoor growing so um, okay so so botrytis is that something that lingers like like doesn't fusarium yes. linger in the soil so even if you like clear yeah. all your plants out and you plant again it's just like yeah. sweet yeah um, um so a, a lot of fungi will go into what we were talking about earlier the the um, state of suspended animation, um, you know, normally called a, a survival it's a good skill to have. <laughs> yeah, a survival structure. So, like powdery mildew has one um, that it can occasionally, at the end of its life, form one of these structures that keeps it essentially alive in this structure. Um, and botrytis definitely has one. As a matter of fact, one of the managing techniques for m managing strategies for managing botrytis in strawberry is to remove infected fruit from, from the rows. So dead fruit from the rows. When you harvest, the harvesters go through and if they spot botrytis, they may leave it or cut it into, or they may see, a, 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 they may drop strawberries that are infected with botrytis. Well, that's a source for more botrytis for the- Well, you're saying they're doing this the accidentally, crop. right? Not intentionally. Some, sometimes they, they cut them to, to squash them and keep them from you know, being at least above the ground. Right. So um, others, if you ever see a harvest in a strawberry field, it's, it's riddled with, you know, dead fruit afterwards. If you don't get in there and clean it up soon and you have infection in that tissue, then you're just risking the next flush of strawberries. Right. Um, same thing. If you grow outdoors in an environment where you leave filthy plant residue after a harvest, let's say you're, out, you're an outdoor grower and you happen to be growing in soil and you don't do something about the survival structures that botrytis may have left in dead tissue you know you you you'll have it there for next year and it's just waiting for you so, know. so so the physical manifestation of botrytis is bud rot basically right yeah you got it that's good and, way to, that's a good way to look and, at it and then what about fusarium what would be its physical manifestation that's a, a number of, of different uh symptoms um the most common so fusarium is one of the wilt diseases right so the plant, everyone knows what a wilting plant looks like. Um, what's interesting about fusarium is, you know, if you have a plant that, that wilted because you forgot to turn the water on for an hour and then you run out there, you turn it back on, it'll, it'll yeah, pick it up. Yeah, it pops right back right? up. But you, you won't do that. It won't do that if it's infected with fusarium, right? Because what fusarium does, it, it gets in from the soil and it, um, it actually plugs the vac vascular system of plants, right? So... Even if the wa even if the soil's wet, they just can't pull water up, and so there's this chronic wilt where they're not getting the water they need. Right? That's typical. The other one, um, the other fusarium uh, symptom would be when a plant dies, and let's say it didn't even die from wilt. You can cut the the base of the stem. Usually, usually the further down you go, the 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 pith, the inside is is uh, is brown it's not the healthy light green color or almost you know yellow color it's brown and soft right and that that could be one of these wilt diseases um best thing to do you know you know we know we know fusarium um lives in soil too and that's how it moves around through the roots um you know if you have old soil and it's in there you know you're you're risking the next crop Right. So what can you do? There's a lot of things you can do. Right. I just that was going to be my question. 
<laughs> yeah, so let's think about what the strawberry growers do. They suffer from these wilt diseases as well. Um, they, conventional strawberry growers will use uh, what's called methyl bromide. Have you heard of that? Um, yeah. Substance that's been... It doesn't sound it, good. It's close, <laughs> it's, it's close to, being, to being banned completely, but um, if they did, my understanding is if they banned it outright, strawberry, the strawberry uh, industry would really suffer. Uh, because so the, like everybody's using it. Yeah. Well, no, no, not everyone's using it, but but it's still it's still something that could I think really hurt the strawberry industry if somebody just Do organic took away. strawberry growers. No, use you it? can't. Okay. You can't. So that it's a toxin. Okay. So buy organic strawberries. Yeah. Is the takeaway. It's a toxin that's actually fumigated into the soil, and there are fields out there where if you didn't do that within a maybe two cycles you're you're just losing money you might as well not plant what is it combating a, a, a rot the the uh the storage uh the the uh the survival structures the fusarium, of the fusarium like, in the soil and other other soil diseases not just fusarium what um when apples rot what is it that's rotting them the famous oh there are a apple, lot there's exactly. a lot of rotten uh, rot, uh apple rot diseases out there um i'm not an apple expert but there there's there's quite a few fire blight's a big one that bacteria um, that, that well, makes... well, so how come banana growers are so fucked with the fusarium? Is it like more you know, vicious once it gets into soil that bananas are in? Because it yeah, seems I like mean, you're like, oh, strawberry growers get it all the time, but they're not like, we need to abandon these 10 acres for the next 30 years. Not 30 years. Or like burn the fields. Not or 30 years, but they will, they will take breaks and grow something else. Because if you just keep it going, you, don't, you just don't not allow enough time for that fungus, to, those survival structures to... To, you know, not, you know, but I thought that period is like years and years and years. It, like it the depends fusarium is like, I'll just hang out until you come back. But it I'm depends on the pathogen, right? What does fusarium feed on? It, it's, a, it's, it's a bacteria, right? Yeah, so fungal. it's a fungal. fungus it's that a gets, fungus. yeah, it yeah. gets into the plant through the, through, um, through the, the roots, yeah. um, makes its way up the vascular system, feeds on whatever sap is going through, mm. begins to multiply. Um, as it grows, it causes clogging of the vascular. It's kind of like, I guess, arthrosclerosis. Kind yeah, of I was going to say getting yeah. Like, uh, yeah. like clogged arteries or whatever. Yeah, like yeah. Pre-heart so, attack. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay, but the good news is Tom doesn't have fusarium in addition to botrytis and but and uh, Yeah, we wouldn't know, but, you know, going back to our conversation we had last Sunday with... Uh, with Chris, you know, we talked again about um, endophytes and, you know, relationships and, um, you know, we, we ourselves have all kinds of microorganisms living in us, right? And on us, you know, the, the, the microflora, in some cases they're beneficial, in other cases they could kill us, but <clears throat> they may not. They may just be living in us um, because we have a nutrient, nutritional source for them, but they don't explode to such levels of infection that they will harm us, you know? So we could have all kinds of pathogens in us that could kill us. Um, and, and the way it happens with, with humans is, it's the same thing that happens in plants, is um, some kind of susceptibility is increased in the human, it can be from a stress, it could be um, from a, another disease, for example, um, some of the um, immuno, um, uh, some of these diseases that affect the immune system, for example, um, AIDS, AIDS affects the immune system, right? Lupus. And then it's something else that kills and, you. And then something that was already in you that was being kept at bay because you're... Pneumonia or something. Yeah, and it, it pops up, same deal. Yeah. So um, I mentioned a, a plant pathologist that I've worked with for years now, um, Steve Koike, and he's seen enough... He's seen enough plants now. I mean, I've, I've asked him this question a number of times, and last I saw him was about a month ago, and he, he was still wondering about that, is how much fusarium is there out there we're just not seeing? Is it really a problem, or is it a problem under certain circumstances? Is, a, is this host susceptibility Do we important? mean a problem in, yeah. Yeah, or, uh, in, in humans? Uh, no, no, in, okay. in plants, in yeah. Plants. So in cannabis, cannabis specifically, specific. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we found... Um, we found fusarium, but it was interesting. Uh, it was the first time I took it to the lab. Uh, I think we collected 30 plants that had symptoms. We sent them in, and two of them had fusarium. Um, 
you know, none of the rest could be detected by any of the, s the symptoms. I mean, Steve plated them out for us. Once, once it grows a few days, it's pretty easy for any mic uh, microbiologist, plant pathologist can identify it usually by looking at the, the Petri dish it was grown in, right? <clears throat> so, you know, okay, so what's the deal here? These, do these have it? Obvi it sounds to me like the symptoms in these plants, even though they're the same as, in these two plants, are the same as these eight over here. Um, it may not be related to fusarium, right? So 30 of the 32 plants did not have it, like, it, it was, even though they yeah, all expressed was, the symptoms. Yeah, yeah, it was. So it was, do they know what those other plants had? They didn't test, you know, they had mosaic appearance of the leaves. You've, you've heard about the mosaic viruses, uh, you know, also affecting the, the crop. Um, they looked like mosaic. They did not have any mosaic. He put them through a panel of, of different pathogens, and basically all he found was fusarium. Now, this was before we knew about the viroid, so if, if well, he had... That, my next yeah, question would be hoplite and viroid. We don't know, because at that, at that time, I don't think the viroid... Um, I think they're called the primers, which is the, what you need for the test, wasn't really commonly available because it was just kind of, we were barely learning about it. Right, right. I, I'm, I re very clearly remember coming back from that, uh, you know, from the, when we sampled, um, it wasn't until months or probably even a year later when I first heard about the viroid, right? And um, had you seen what turned out to be the viroid much earlier? And then when people told you that there was this viroid and this is what it does, you were like, I've seen, you know, that. you know, the testing, the heavy testing for viroid happened after I left um, where I worked and and moved to beneficial insectary. That was really when everyone started to really key in on testing. And um, some places went out and tested all their, um, you know, their mother tissue every single plant <clears throat> and eliminated every one that that had the viroid in it so it was it was a it was some time ago that you know i i, I learned about fusarium actually you know potentially being a problem in cannabis before i learned about the viroid <laughs> it's like every year there's some new disease it's oh like, that's not even up? every year it's every few i months. went in on this cannabis party and too and fusarium where does it come from? like where would it come from how would it be introduced it could also be a survival structure Tom, a it, mommy it, it, and a daddy fusarium have a baby fusarium is that what it, <laughs> yeah i mean if, but how do they get into your garden i Are mean they brought in uh from, it, it could uh, have come in, in with your soil oh, okay it could have right. it could be in there could be that some other plant here in your garden is susceptible to it and there are survival structures and you were watering your lawn Sorry, one day so, and so, so the same strain of fusarium could be infecting other plant species yeah too. well okay well um there i know of at least two i think it's three species of fusarium that we found at in our soil right um one of them the one that's thought to be the main culprit is fusarium oxysporum and that's the, the same one that hits other crops like, like give me an example of another crop that it loves i believe that's strawberries that's the main fusarium but Fuck. You know. so, so basically it's like yeah i mean that, that that's like a super disease that can like like you know how like uh coronavirus it's like they don't think necessarily cats and dogs like we couldn't transmit it to a cat but they can to transmit us. it to a person well, but is, yeah. with, with this it's like it could go from like Tom's cannabis plant to like the neighbor's strawberries and then like the next neighbor's growing weed and it's like what's that like well, exactly so you do yeah so I can find food sources yeah there's uh there are everywhere. there are really interesting strawberries and weed in SoCal well it's uh, like fusarium I got or one for really you the middle of the state where you have all these different crops. central yeah. coast yeah. well you're surrounded by them um <laughs> I got another one for you okay um so 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 think about this so the, the um I was talking about grapes and botrytis, right? Um, so the, grape that, the grapes that are typically affected by botrytis are the Pinot Noir and Chardonnay grape. Those are very commonly, uh, that's a very common fungal uh, problem. These are thin skinned grapes, remember we talked about that? They're not very tolerant of very high temperatures so they could easily get sunburned and damaged. So that's why they they're normally best grown in, specific in coastal, of France. coastal cool climates that also happen to have a high humidity so that they have a very susceptible host with the thin cluster, thin skins that are clustered tight. And then they have the, the perfect environment 
And then as soon as that spore lands there, guess what? You have the disease, the triangle components, right? So Botrytis scenario is By the happens way, does, to be does the Tom same. Have the triangle here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you, at some point, there, there had to have been some kind of weather event. Um, I'm but, pretty but, convinced it was the, the, the heat wave. Because well, okay. How about this? Really so we, so we have a new batch of, of auto babies that I just brought over. So they'll be susceptible. Yeah. But wouldn't it imply that they need the same shitty like weather event? Yeah, but <clears throat> let's think about this. We're, we can talk about macro environment, or right? Or since it's already here, it could easily get to them. Okay, so, so let's talk about the macro environment, and right? There's That's, those behind you as well, don't forget. The yeah. We got it everywhere. Yeah, yeah <laughs> no, so there's, there's not a plant that does not Essentially have they're everywhere. It's like COVID, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Um, even in the White House. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, have, you, have you ever noticed how your biggest buds, that top cola, are the ones that are normally first affected by botrytis? Right. So yeah, I mean, you can see it. Up there. Have you? And then sec second question is um, those were the ones that you were trimming where you saw it first. Right. You cut those off because they were the top bud. Yeah. Right. That's usually a really big bud up there. Right. Well, we Tight, cut, tightly we cut those because Tom didn't want the neighbor to see his gigantic plants. Uh, uh, OK. Like, All right. Yeah, yeah. Like, so you injured the plant. <laughs> leaning gave into it, their gave yard. Gave it botrytis and entry. Uh, 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 <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So. Um, what about that microenvironment inside the flower? Have you noticed that botrytis starts from inside the flower? Right? The gray mold usually, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't on occasion start on the outside tissue. Even, even on stems, you'll see botrytis. Um, that, I haven't seen that routinely, but I have seen it. Um, that big flower, which is tight, um, that's not one solid piece of plant. There's nooks and crannies in there, right? And we're talking about microscopic uh, spores, right? So we're talking about a very, humid environment in there, right? And it's also dark and, and, you know, so even something like raising the humidity for a few hours at the wrong time, oh, that, that big bud, once it's closed up and gotten tight, that's close to harvest, right? What happens to fruit once it, it's closer to harvest? It softens, right? All of a sudden now that host is much more susceptible because it's began to, it started to decompose. It's part of the natural plant process to decompose tissues get thinner and more easy to for the for the so fungus it's weak. fungus what's that I'm it's sorry? weak it's vulnerable it's it's, it's weaker, weaker it's softer it's full of sugar it's yeah. it's, it's 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 got spores inside it's of the like bud. a salmon that swum all the way upstream and the bear is just sitting there being like this is too easy yeah like, <laughs> right you got it it's You're a tired. good analogy good analogy can, so <laughs> so each part of these this triangle fast. can 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 give you a different impact. In this case, you had a, the susceptible host was caused, you know, if you notice it started on your biggest bud. So the ones that were the ripest were more susceptible and the caterpillars came and bit holes into them and allowed faster entry into the flower. And uh, you, you basically, you got susceptibility of hosts. Maybe the environment didn't have as much to do with it. Um, this time around, um, you know, but there was presence there of, of the uh, of the fungus. There was a uh, susceptibility and and the environment had to have been at some point perfect for it to have um, yeah. germinated. Yeah. We did it, Tom. <laughs> so proud. <laughs> What's so that? Proud. Uh, <laughs> Actually, you know, the, this the is biggest learning. cold is the ones at the top were the last one that they seem oh, really? to. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. The they ones... were pretty brown up there. Yeah. Well, now they are. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got, I mean, I, it's kind of remarkable. I don't know, um, like, uh, <laughs> to see, I mean, how much feces is out there. It's practically every <laughs> bud. Yeah. Have um, you never seen, have you, is this like the most feces in a, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> per plant yeah. that you've it's, seen? It's Tom, my God, we are breaking records. Well, I mean, And he's seen know, a lot of commercial facilities hey listen you learn you learn about a really important symptom and um you know now you know to monitor for moths early you know okay to... right so, so the recap for next year's start uh -huh. what, what's our prescriptive strategy again it's what i do what i do is i is that your daughter wasps. is that your daughter Gemma? yeah give her a quarter for every caterpillar she brings to yes. you right and then get everyone and maybe it is only corn earworm right now you know You're now we can ice look cream at sandwiches there you go <laughs> now, now we can look for what does that moth look like. Now you're gonna have to set up traps probably at some point, right? Start setting up uh, light traps are a good way. You know, moths are attracted to light. 
Um, is there a pheromone trap that's like attractive? literally the zapping light? Oh, any light, right? Moths fly around these light bulbs, right? No, 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 but, but you're saying put a trap out. Yeah, you don't have to put a zapping trap, that'll destroy it, but a sticky card trap or something like that. You can buy moth traps that are based on glue to, you know, so maybe that's a way to do it. There's also what are called the delta traps. You may have seen them. The county puts them out for different flying pests. It's a little folded, looks like a little tent, little paper tent that's hung in the tree that has glue all on the inside and it has a little pheromone which is actually intended to attract the male. Now if you capture some of those moths, that'll tell you what kind of caterpillars you're gonna wind up with, right? Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Perhaps. Uh, Maybe? Yeah. Well, okay, so um, um, omnivor omnivorous leaf roller, is it a problem in cannabis? I've never heard of any of these leaf roller families being a problem in cannabis. I have heard of them showing up and feeding a bit um, right. but, but what's the what's the one Tom has? But here it's a uh, corn earworm. <laughs> and what um, what's the adult version of that called? It's uh, the, the same corn ear. Corn, corn ear. It's a, yeah, it's a corn ear uh, moth. Corn, it's corn a, ear it's, butterfly. It's he Helicoverpa zea. What's the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Uh, mostly moths are night flyers. You know, ah, mostly. Okay. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. But, um, likewise, most ca most butter. I think that's. I mean, there's there's families. There's. I mean, there's there's. I'm, I'm really not. Yeah, very, I never really see caterpillars flying around at night. I'm like not good the at the, what, what are called the, the order Lepidoptera. It's a tough one. It's, I mean, distinguishing leaf roller moths from each other. It, it, that gave me fits in school. Yeah. Um, you have to turn them over. That'll be, I'll train, oh my, I'll oh train goodness, Gemma yeah. in that skill. Yeah, well, so, so <laughs> we, we don't know, but, but we, I've never seen mealybug in, in, um, in cannabis. And I've heard some people say, oh, yeah, I've seen it. And, I kind of found it hard to believe. It's like, I've never seen it. Well, that's, that's a little bit arrogant, um, just because I haven't seen it. Um, I got a photo of some from Texas a few months ago. So maybe leaf rollers aren't a problem in California cannabis, but what's it going to do to Oklahoma, right? So knowing what's around and what's coming Regional in. Regional pests. Yeah. So, so, so what were you seeing a lot of in, in NorCal? Well, actually, in SoCal, too. You're up and down the coast. So what were you seeing it's that, this year? That's the main one. Oh, so we Corn have what are. everyone's getting. This it's, year. it's not the only one they're getting. Okay. I, um, actually, but like I, this is a noticeable uptick in this across California from previous years. No, oh. no. In fact, it could have could have been a pretty OK year. But actually, the some of the Lake County growers I work with, um, they uh, they are reporting um, they are reporting a bad caterpillar. Year. Like, OK, uh, Lake County. Yeah. So, so like the caterpillars are honed into some different regions. So I was at um, a greenhouse operation in Salinas. <laughs> There's a caterpillar. Um, and, you know, we found the damage. We found the damage. I could see it. It's like, okay, it's a matter of time. No turds. I didn't see any feces at all. Just a matter of looking around. And there he was. It's about that long. This is not, does not look like a corn earworm, but I'm not positive. Like I said, a lot of, a lot of these. Wait, is that the one from here? No, no. this is from a, a grown Salinas I, I caught I yesterday. Could be, it could be younger. It could be a, a younger <laughs> one. Yeah, it was bright green. It even painted the alcohol green. Do you have like hundreds green. of vials? You know? Do you have like yeah. hundreds of vials with different insects in them? Not anymore. Not hundreds. Now, what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> well, so I'm gonna take it back, and I'm gonna look at it under a scope. And I'm gonna look at features. Sorry, where where was that one from? It was a Selena screen. Yes. Do Greenhouse. you need okay. to uh, develop a program from them based on that? It helps because then you can target to the most effective wasp, right? Right. right. Um, that that so, helps. Okay. So so, so by I'm the way, next away. next yeah. season you you need to show up. What's today? Like October. What are we? What day? Ballpark. Well, the third today. October third. So he should have shown up here like September first, for like the hmm. IPM inspection slash well, we, strategy. Well, we were going to have season. an IPM person. I know, time, but <laughs> that's then true. It, it fell apart. But then coronavirus. Because yeah. we knew that this was something we wanted to. <laughs> yeah. We just didn't. We did uh, want to have this. Yeah. Like two yeah. months ago. Yeah. Or a month and a half. Ago. Yeah. I mean, monitoring starts. Monitoring yeah. starts when you bring the first plant into your grow and never ends after that. Here, I'm gonna leave these for you. And uh, I, right. I, I, give, I hand these out to right. some of our customers. Nice. What do we just put alcohol in it or what do you yeah, put in just it? Just isopropyl alcohol or... And then the bug? And if you find it, catch it, kill it. If you don't, I mean, we live close, so you, I could actually get it from you. You could come you. pick it up. We yeah, could, could show up. up here. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, 
but if not, if you're far off somewhere, you know, another okay, state. Okay, so, so people send you guys bugs. You don't, they don't like, even have to send the bug. Just just catch it, a, catch it, kill it in alcohol, then stretch it out so it's not moving around on you and take photos, very close photos, right. very clear photos from different angles. And off, not often, sometimes it's not enough. Um, we've got so, a really good so team. What are, with, what are some of the interesting bugs that have come across your radar recently that that people have like done that and taken pictures and sent them to you guys oh geez there's a lot well i just saw do you have that scale insect where did that leaf end up oh oh yeah. it's it's over on the uh the straw okay yeah because um I That's took new. pictures of it while it was uh Where'd you leave it over there? on the okay. straw over there yeah but i'm gonna see about you know taking this thing uh, back so, so what did you find interesting about that well, there's a scale insect. Oh, a scale insect. Yeah, but I think it, I think I think it may be dead now, actually, because it was it was on green tissue. This was green about half hour ago. Oh wait, so here, ago. put it down. I can actually get a. I, I have you. I have a photo anyway. It's a. Uh, it was it was a lot lighter orange it? color. It's right there. That brown thing. Yeah. yeah I, All right. I can. I took a photo before it. Before it met its end. Here, here's a really good one here. Oh, wow. Wow, is that that? Yep. Hold on, I'm gonna get a super. And what is that? You don't it's know. It's a soft scale. Oh, I don't okay. know which one yet. But what's a soft scale? It's another insect that sucks on plant sap and feeds on them and wow. is a problem in some crops. Um, citrus has the... Um, California citrus scales. Do these carry, scale. have pathogens within them? It looks like a little I don't know tiny a lot raisin. about scales. Yeah. You know what it, look at this photo Doesn't here. Doesn't it look like a raisin? Does it look sure. like a turtle shell to you? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, that's what they look like. They're little. And what is it? It's, it's, like a, it's a soft scale. I don't know which one. Oh, that's the type of insect. Mm-hmm. And um, what, what's like that family common for, like known for? Well, they, they'll feed on plant sap, yeah. right? Um, but do they become a problem? You don't know enough yet, but that's brand Did new. That's the first the time wind? I've seen that. Yes, these the adults are the adults can fly, right? Um, the males can fly, I believe it is mostly. But they're 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 so small that they'll be yeah. carried on the. Yeah, and if there's females around, then they'll mate, and um, the females will lay eggs. So um, this thing has wings. These these often actually these have a these actually are have keep their eggs inside of them so if you flip them over in fact if you had a scope we could do it although i think it's fried now because it's sat in the sun yeah. but um was it so it was alive before yeah well Probably look at the color difference there. look at the color difference yeah. it's it's this was a green leaf like half hour ago right yeah, that thing's a big yeah and um it, it's cool it's i probably still have enough to make some kind of close identification of it um but yeah is that it right there uh, no, it is where'd it go did it's right here. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So, yeah, it still kind of looks like a like a, a, a turtle, right? But now it's more shriveled. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Good eye, man. And so you haven't really seen that? I haven't ever. I mean, we suspected a possible. Oh, are, this is amazing. I yeah, suspected a possible. We it's we. Like a petri dish here. <laughs> my my colleagues and I had had a, a, a few photos that a grower sent that we argued was is it scale is it is it um a seed a seed that that's uh I, i'm sure if i went to a scale expert that they, they'd be able to id that that's an that's an okay photo right there you can see that's that could sure. be yeah. this little dot here could be where it's uh where it's waste drops out of jim we're looking at bugs so yeah so i will take him but see what i mean is if i don't get him i can't positively id him because i haven't seen him or her it's actually her um <laughs> Gemma, before Gemma, who gave you the ipad <laughs> is laura the best host ever so 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 tom she look around for more food. of this huh yeah look around for more of this because yeah cause, yeah text me that picture yeah and I'll send you uh, these ones. It's, it's not difficult, right? No, not at all. All right, little, so, little, so little this yellow is amazing. Turtle. All right, yeah. so Tom had. Let's recap again. Tom had botrytis. <laughs> you're you're rubbing it in now. Now you're rubbing it in. He had the scale bug, right? 
Yeah, which again, we don't know if this is even a problem, right? Could have been a confused. Uh, but you've never seen it before. So we, not this, no. Even if it's not causing problems, it's never been seen before. No, and yeah, but we're so new at this, right? I'm right. sure I'm sure someone else has seen it. Uh, oftentimes they'll right. see it but not be able I'm to see it. I'm just saying like it it hasn't been like if you've never seen it, it hasn't mm -hmm. probably been commonly seen like maybe no. one guy's seen it a couple times. So that bodes well, right? If if no one's seen it and you find one, uh there's a there's a, a bug that Particularly but like, what, what's the last thing that's kind of been like the uh, what's the Asian wasp like the big gargantuan oh, yeah. one that's what what's it called? Yeah, the that like the killer killer like wasp. Tom? Yeah, that one. <laughs> that giant one. <laughs> but anyway, like that something where killer. someone saw the first one and then it's like shit. Like I guess it would have to be you know most recently was that the cannabis aphid, you know that that blew up. Uh, so I I heard about it, and again I'm you know, like what what was the last year no one talked about it? No one talked about it in in Salinas because keep in mind it's a tiny area that I I worked in. Uh, nobody talked about it. Um, let's see, not eighteen we saw it. Um, Seventeen, sometime like around 16? 2016. Sometime around 2016, nobody was talking about. And then suddenly, like anything. some people were talking about. Well, no, it. no, Oregon and Colorado, and um, it had been described. It's not like it got discovered on cannabis. It, it, um, it's a hemp aphid. You know, it, it evolved on hemp. In but were Oregon the old world. growers and Colorado growers seeing it even earlier than 2016? You know, I'd have like to go back and sort look of at this. I'm not, I'm not great about exactly when it happened, but there was there was a bulletin sent out by the the, the Oregon Department of Agriculture to all the cannabis growers, because they legalized a little earlier, right? Um, it, they, that hey, this is a pest of cannabis. Be wary of it. Um, it it got to Salinas, like I said, the first infestation I experienced was in 2018. We were. At first, it was difficult to figure out what to do about it. Now we have some strategies. How problematic was it at first? Was it destroying whole crops? That's the problem is we never, we never took the data. And that's, again, I, I want to stress that is we really, really need the growers to get diligent about that. Um, there well, was like one reporting it. Yeah, there was a situation where that first infestation hit, hit me. It was about probably an area of about 500 square feet that it was a mess. It was a total mess. And um, I begged that we harvested it earlier so it wouldn't spread to the rest of the crop. In the end, we were able to contain it to one area, but it was bad. Um, it was really, really bad, um, where to the point where they crawled off of it. I mean, it looked like an army crawling off of it when it was um, where it's drying. Uh, where when we were drying the, the buds, um, they crawled off. And, you know, I, I, that's right, right when I left Harborside. And I said, hey, I beg you check the potency and yield on this, please, you know, but unfortunately nobody went that next step and said, hey, let's go, let's look at what this aphid in this extreme situation did to this bud. I mean, we're not going to know what it, what potential it had. You mean did, well, that's what I was going to say. Did, was there a baseline of like, no, this but thing you could, expressed itself this amazingly last year? And this well, year there's that, there's that. Of, you could, you could compare it to the rest of that crop in that, and the, the different, maybe there was a, the same exact strain in the same exact greenhouse, well, but it, in another it's, corner. It's, it's like, years and wine grapes right like there it are certain time. years that are like yeah exceptional years and the bottles reflect that in their price yeah some something like that i guess yeah so but you know that would have been a great one where okay take good record of the yield of that particular strain um and then do it again the next time you grow that strain and and then do it once uh, you know keep them under you know keep them from being attacked maybe put special special um you know more resources into keeping that strain from being attacked and then now grow one where you have okay i had a successful crop with it here and compare your yields per square foot and compare your potency in the flower and then if you found a drop in one percent yield and half of a percent of potency was it a problem it looked ugly right and it, yeah, it made it stick around in your garden, in your grow, and it moved to other crops. So yeah, that's a problem. But how problematic is it really? How damaging is it? It's just really early. Although at a certain point, you know, we know in other crops, aphid infestations, when, when you see a plant covered with aphid, that can't be good, right? But how many are tolerable, right? We just don't, we just don't know the research. Is, 
What if? Wasn't that the point of like some pests is good? Lots like of a species, like having a couple aphids, like not, I wouldn't use good, but like not negative. Let's put it this way. And then like, but having a ton is obviously the. Nature's typically balanced, right? You don't see massive infestations, you know, well, unless like somehow humans might have, in, you know, interfered, but you do see them on occasion, but nature balances itself, right? Populations of predators climb with the populations of the pests, pest populations drop off, populations of predators drop off. It's a cycle. I mean, it's like my compost bin where like there's a food source outside my house where there never had been one and now black soldier flies nice, are yeah. like and their larvae i mean it's like millions of or not millions but like yeah, yeah. hundreds of them in in like in my worm bin they're in there too the nice. worms aren't very they're just like i love those guys I, was, I gotta tell you i gotta tell you a story sometime about those because i was i was playing about worms or black soldier fly soldier fly larva yeah and cannabis oh. <laughs> I love them, but they keep the, the larvae keep finding their way under the, the floorboards into the house. And so my, my wife sees like these larvae crawling across the floor. And yeah, is I was I was not... growing them indoors myself and I would occasionally... like when I see them, I'm like, sweet, like, yeah. let me release you outside. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's cool. Do your job. Yeah. And she's like, the fuck. Is but yeah, it, it's it's like maggot. that. So, something's going to come. You plant something, something's going to come. And you, you know, we've you've made something artificial here, right? Um, some of the pests. Well, it's less that artificial us. than just the grass, though. It is. Yeah, it's getting back yeah. to. But you've brought a, a, a non-native plant into this environment. That is true. And who was here waiting? Cornier worm was here waiting. It's susceptible. <laughs> All the native pests yeah. that have been yeah. waiting. Patiently. Cornier worm was probably around here for since you bought the house. You know, it's been here forever. Where has it been feeding? I don't know. Maybe your neighbor has some corn or, uh, you know. Oh, does it love corn? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a critical. Clever, I mean, I guess clever it's name. name it but... actually likes corn ears. Ah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. so, so it focuses specifically. Would the ear be the outside part? No, the ears. Uh, is the actual yeah. kernels. So it'll it'll do the same thing. It'll dig oh, it'll into go corn. Inside, it'll yeah. go into the, the core. Like yeah. the... I'll tell you what. Go to your farmer's market. If there's anyone here that grows corn oh. locally. You know, um, that bat Bacillus sturingensis uh -huh. um, is uh, that bacteria I told you about, um, one of the first successful Monsanto GMOs. Uh, they, they took corn and, it, and inserted the gene of the Bacillus sturingensis into the corn. So the corn naturally produces the Bt toxin. And when the corn earworm feeds on it, it dies. The corn is poisonous to it. But not to us. He, we do the but same thing with cannabis. But it doesn't know that's about to eat poison. Potentially. Wait, and what? That's exactly what Monsanto will, will yeah, do. That's oh, what would want to do. That's what Monsanto's going to do. Yeah. Like it starts munching on the buds. Yeah, if you go, make a BT like, cannabis. Uh, they'll grow BT yeah, make cannabis. A, make a BT cannabis and then you, you, you if it's What's a What's BT short for? A bacillus sturingensis. Okay. Yeah. So, and they've, they've done it for corn. And guess what? It, it made the difference between people in Africa, you know, having something to eat, having crops and not, you know, it's, I, oh, yeah. but it's, it's a uh, around here, but, but on that front though, Tom, what if you grow some BT corn out here yeah. around the, all, ah, all around Ah, as like a, what do you call it? A banker plant? A trap, not a, a trap, trap plant. Crop. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 See what I'm getting Tom, That would be the power move. Some yeah. Monsanto out corn. Yeah on the perimeter yeah. not to even eat just for it's well, it is keep in mind it 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 evolved it, we think it evolved on grasses mm -hmm. grow put some out to grow out here and because these same that, caterpillars like, you, like, don't they have a patent type? you can you buy know, it you could definitely buy, you buy you, bt you just, corn you just couldn't like breed and then sell them to other people oh, yeah. or use them yourself. grow it actually that's and the, the crazy the thing moth, that. the you moth will even, fly to it lay its eggs on it as soon as the caterpillar hatches and starts feeding and it doesn't move into your crop. It's possible that corn earworm moth likes the smell of corn better than cannabis. So maybe more moths will who go. Would, who would? I mean, that doesn't. I mean, they, they were so pungent, you know. know. They were amazing. They're still pungent. Tom, they had huge potential. But, but, but GMO crops, that's, uh, I don't know, that's not really sexy in cannabis, right? <laughs> but, no, but it's interesting true. to have it as the trap plant. Uh, yeah. And to be like, I'm yeah. not even going to eat the corn. Yeah. There are other BT crops yeah. out there too. Uh, you know, again, I don't want to be. Well, GMO accused. cannabis is an inevitability. 
you know. Heck, it could be, you know. But not in Tom's backyard. No, but you know, there's genetic modifications <laughs> oh, that are Easter. not. Tom may be I rethinking mean, that after, remember, <laughs> after no, this but, round. But remember that, that there is more than just outdoor grown cannabis. You have greenhouse and indoor cannabis. And typically they have that extra protection of exclusion. So right. they have screening well, or they the, have. The question is, is there, are there unintended consequences to making the BT corn? That, that, oh yeah, there can be very. Yeah. There, we don't know for sure yet, but there, there can be, you know, that, that, that. Because, yeah, you're making it resistant to these, you know, to these yeah. disease, to these disease and this, this predator. But, you know, what's the trade off? Are you killing? There's a lot of trade offs. Nutrients. Uh, there, and, we don't and, well, know. And what it does to your body. Well, we don't know that yet, but you know, imagine a, you've you've heard these stories, right? A farmer down the road from a Monsanto farmer yeah, got gets cross like pollinated, pollinated, and then it's the, the fucked he up can't thing is use like his it's seed. then his fault. <laughs> it's the wind's right. fault, and he can't right. use his seed. Right. There, and there are no laws, I guess, between right. from pollen flying from one farm to another. Right. Right. So it, that's a huge, you huge trespassed problem. onto my property, and now I have to pay you. Uh, you stole, uh, yeah, I have to pay you now. I can't use my own seed, you know. But you know, it's 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 all handled in the in the courts, and if you've got the money, you've got the lawyers. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was Monsanto's strategy, just to bulldoze legally. Yeah. So there are those, and then and then seeds. you know you could you could consider you know corn has wild relatives out there, and if then if you you know if there was some kind of cross pollination with a wild relative, I mean that's possible. Now you've created this wild plant that is with that defense that is mechanism. protected from caterpillars and then what happens with that can it now dominate and outcompete other plants in the same you know yeah cornibus mm -hmm. cornibus <laughs> it's a cro yeah fuzzy bear <laughs> <laughs> i don't know it's it's a it's a topic it's a it's fun to talk about it but um yeah you'd have this wild uh mutant gene that's like sees its path to like total freedom by not being controlled right <laughs> so right like yeah exactly <laughs> but again you know like i said uh ear uh, cor um, caterpillars are are a problem usually in outdoor cannabis and then the next would be in greenhouse you could get pro you can have problems <laughs> tom's um, gonna move into the well we are gonna we, maybe this is our inspiration to finally set up the uh the end, yeah. Well, yeah, they're they're tough to battle, but, but the strategy is once again monitoring, yeah. and and acting early. You know, as soon as you have any hint that it's time to act with these guys, uh, with these with these bugs, then then act. You know, start your BT sprays. Um, start. Uh, this is hemp, right? No. No, this is can't. This is. High THC. Is it? Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought you said it was this high CBD. No, yeah. Well, no. So, all right. This one's like right down the middle. The autos are actually. Okay. But you're, high gonna, you're CBD. selling it as THC cannabis, or I mean, you're growing it for. Yeah. yeah if you were growing it commercially, selling. you'd be selling it as THC. As, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so yeah, because I was gonna say in hemp, I'm not, I'm not as aware of the laws, but then you still have that other weapon that that spinosad I told you about. I, I'm not sure if that's legal in hemp still. I know it's not good. It's not in cannabis, but in hemp it might be. So you have another weapon. You know, you got your sprays. Start your wasp releases early. They're really not that expensive. You know, just we, you know, we recommend a certain frequency and a certain amount. Some growers say, ah, I'm going to double the frequency and I'm going to triple the amount. That's how bad I want to protect, and that's how, that's the kind of investment I want to make to to just have one more weapon uh, to throw at them. Well, you deal mostly, with, obviously, with with commercial grows. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously everything would be less, I mean, oh, yeah. for a, just a little home yeah. growth. So <laughs> our, the yeah. smallest container we sell at trigger grandma wash is going to be, you know, tenfold more than more you than you that. need. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how much, so what does that cost? Oh, <laughs> uh, I'd have to dig into we it. <laughs> well, well, ballpark. Um, well, go, go to our website, right. um, greenmethods.com <laughs> and, and that's, answer. that's kind of the retail, that's our retail website. So you can see what that. But of course, if you're commercial, then you there's hundreds of dollars. Oh, I mean, no, they're they're you know we rear them ourselves. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, we're, yeah, they're not they're not that expensive. Okay. It's it's totally worth it. Let's yeah. put it that way for prevention. It's I mean, you can see this. I go through, count, cut your heart. I would you, if you're gonna harvest this for oils or whatever you're gonna do with it. But take the time to 
to give them to your, to your daughter and, and have her go through every one and, and, and see how many of them have the turds in them because I, I, I saw, I, I don't think I saw one that didn't. It seems like they all hit you and, um, you know, it's, and it could just be the drying of the, of the, the chewed up bud too, you know, it's, yeah, so it's well worth it. Look at, look for other caterpillars. So, and, so um, we got worm poo. I mean, the question is then also, where's, where are all the caterpillars? Or, Good or, question. Can, or can one caterpillar I, do a I lot of damage I bet if we started digging in there. Can, can they? It can. It they can. can. But normally they don't move like. They don't move. Right. They kind of yeah. like, yeah. But this could have been any number of, of events. I mean, I, I did not see classic botrytis, you know, mycelia, you know, the, the, the hyphae. I didn't see it. So, you know, I'm still like, what, what, what the hell? It's dry. So know? does that mean that potentially it's not botrytis well, at all? It, you know, it looks, a lo it looks like botrytis. Uh, um, it looks like that end stage of botrytis. I was in here, you know, a few weeks, a week ago to see what it was like, but, but, uh, yeah, you know. Switch. I broke up. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, see, well, yeah, there, there's some gray there. It's tough. I, um, I've seen a lot of botrytis, but this is, this is odd. So, but yeah, look for more caterpillars. Just find as many as you can and send them my way or I can pick them up when I'm out here again. Um, so you live in LA? Yeah, I live in Palms, just in Palms. north of Culver City. Cool. Yeah, so I, I, I have a few growers that, out here in the valley. I was just here last week or the week before uh, visiting Indoor some of guys? Them. Indoor guys, yeah. 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 And what do they have to deal with? Well, indoor and greenhouse pet pest complex is a lot more is a lot more similar. Um, indoor guys have a really a harder time with root aphid mm -hmm. than than maybe the greenhouse ones do, and then outdoor guys have very little problem with root aphid. So it seems to be like the opposite with the caterpillar, right? With the that you you get a lot of indoor growers that are saying I can't get rid of these root aphid, whereas in greenhouses you might have easier control and then the outdoors are rarely a problem. I've not heard of a problem outdoors. Usually what happens is an infested plant, if it gets, if it's got them in the pot and it gets transplanted to the soil, they'll off, that'll end, usually that'll often end the infestation of root aphid, just transplanting outdoors. You know? So it's like, um, so different environments. That's interesting. So yeah. people who are like propagating in greenhouses for outdoor grows, they could have root aphids in the indoor part and then bring them out. And it's been seen before, and I, we have hypotheses on why that's the case. You know, so well, that's a sense. clue right there. There's something in that indoor environment that is conducive that the root aphid likes. I tend to think more. So my my hypothesis is um, those are not very good diggers the aphids are uh, root aphid it's rice root aphid actually came from rice um it was a pest of rice let's say um that's how it was identified so it was called rice root aphid but it does like so other th crops. this this is a it jumps plant species too yeah I, I know it's a problem in you know the the monocots like the grasses rice being one of them so would it be a problem with corn i don't know but I know it's also a problem in broadleaf because I know it's a problem in Salinas uh, celery, right? The same exact aphid. And we know that it, it, infects, it infests uh, cannabis. But what I was getting to is, is I don't, I mean, I'd like more data on this, but I've done a lot of this where, you know, found infested pots of aphid and then after harvest cut the, cut the, um, the root ball in half and looked for them and they weren't. In, wow. inside the pot. They were populating that space between the soil and the pot. Wow. That, that, yeah. which makes it that, that border there, wow. which makes it a lot easier with all those spaces and caverns in there for them to move around and for them to find roots. So that's their optimal place to hang out once um, they're- Yeah, if you notice indoor growers, gr rock wool growers, yeah. you know, the, the, the rock wool cubes are wrapped Guess where they are? They're in between that plastic and the, they might have gone into, you know, the, the rock wool is just like fiberglass, right? It's a bunch of la laminy, you know, of just layers of, of what glass. What do they do? feed on the roots? Yeah, they feed on the roots, yeah. They just can get into some of those little 
those little crevices too. So, but so hydro growers deal with them too. Hydro growers deal with them too. Um, I I often say um, like soil is probably the best because um, like like I would be hard pressed to think that you're ever gonna find your root aphid become a problem in that setup because they have to they don't dig well. Like I said, they can they can move in those cracks um, at, to get to the roots. Well, roots are a little bit farther away from the walls. And by the time the roots do get to the walls of, the, of those pots there, I mean, that plant might be so large enough to yeah. where it's not a problem. Yeah. For them. So the, the environment really so defines where it, the vulnerabilities are. It could. Yeah. It could. Tom, I remember this same view two weeks ago it was beautiful and epic <laughs> of these lush yeah. plants. I know. And, and you know what? That's actually, I, I mean, hate to learn from this experience, but um, how long really was that? Two weeks ago, you said? Yeah. What if you'd cut, what would your yield have been if you'd cut last weekend? Right. Double what you have now, right? So it's, it's a lesson for some growers. I mean, most growers, they, they're aware of this. As soon as they see one flower, they're, they're in there cutting. Um, lesson is, if, if this was Botrytis, which looks like it, and, um, you know, it, it, it may be... I always used to say, Salinas is our place to grow cannabis if you don't have good, good environmental control. Um, and I always used to say, if, you know, without the, the good environmental control, we don't call the harvest, but try to cause the harvest. Right. It's the one that decides, you either pick me, you either harvest me now, or, <laughs> or I will take it. everything. Or I'll take it all, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, you know, sometimes growers, that, that's tough to do. You've gone through the whole life, and then the last week or two is when this starts up. And you're like, what the hell? And at that point, it's... Smartest thing we did once when we did have a little problem was, was harvest early and send that out fresh frozen to live resin. And yeah, the yields suffered, but it was not as bad as if we had let the cola go to a dried up crumbly, yeah. you know. I mean, this might still have THC in it. And it, I've- I've- Tom, <laughs> you can use the, the turbo over there. Yeah, there, there's, there's, <laughs> me, there's, I mean, we, we probably all smoked Mexican weed that looked worse yes. than that, <laughs> right? That is so, true. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone. Fortunately, not for a nice. very long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is has been really interesting. Um, I, I mean, I, I thought about that, but I didn't even know. I mean, how? I mean, because the flowering cycle was really started, but relatively recently too, and that was really fast too. And it was Everything was beautiful, and we saw that. We saw that one yeah, caterpillar. It was, it was. Yeah, and this so is my we killed, the first time I've done this. That's what you know. You know now. Yeah. As soon as you see it, yeah. a moth, you know, you got to set up traps next year once you, yeah. as soon as you, you start, as soon as you take Tom's the Tom's like from Rocky knocked down by Apollo Creed and it's an eight count and he's getting back up to plant again <laughs> next season. Yeah. Well, it's not too late, right? He's, Couldn't he's you do another out of He's not going to take defeat. But yeah, you yeah. just, uh, you know, the other thing we talked about is uh, if we, were, we are talking about Botrytis, which, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not really convinced yet. Um, Wait, you're not convinced 100% that hundred percent that that's okay. what's going on. But you're here. like 98%. Yeah, it's just I don't see like typical structures of the fungus. It's all dried out. And the fact that I see all that. <laughs> you're seeing a unique disease. As, Tom, maybe in addition I, as, to the scale, which is unique, we also have well, I mean, a previously that, that's undiscovered the thing disease. Is like, there's no question that there's something like... Going you know, on. it's not. Yes, there's. I mean, <laughs> but it's like a disease rather than yeah, just like. It's, a, it's just. It's yeah. just again. Break those buds open, and if you find feces in every one, I mean, I did. I looked at a yeah, lot. Yeah. A few, quite then, a few of them. We yeah. saw a lot of fecal then matter. Then it is. Then it is the cat. Yeah. And then where are they? Where did they go? Did they finish their? Did, you know, they've got to go into a. And pupil. you've become an expert in identification of the different fecal matter from different uh, species of caterpillar. No, but you know, there's a difference between like <laughs> snail. Do you, do you aspire to that snail, skill set? Eventually, I'll get there. I guess. I Maybe mean, we'll train. That that's one of our Gemma trainings, <laughs> to be able to identify the different uh, caterpillar poop by flavor. <laughs> by flavor, yeah. By taste. work. Corn earworm tastes a little corny. All right. Well, 
I think that was a good, well, yeah, that a was good really, deep dive, really and deep and I dive think we have a, a a semi game plan for earlier in the season next year. Oh yeah, I mean, just start monitoring. Look into again. First step, let's ID those. Collect as many as you can and put them in jars. I left you these, and then uh, you know, because that that's where it starts. And then it. okay, well, we we have at least we know who's hitting us. Yeah, and we well, know the one we had on the table. Uh, 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 what is it? What does a caterpillar do? Inched, <laughs> it inched away. Yeah. It, it, anyway, it's it, it's. You, let's say you know you have three of them eating your buds, three different species eating your buds, and you go look for what the adults look like. You figure out how to identify them, and that's what you that's what you look for in your traps. As soon as you see that one of those adults, Tom, that would be epic if we actually identified two different dis specific species. It happens. And next year we're totally prepared for them. Right. And we, we we actually discover them, so then we right. get, we and, get and to name them. And they're also new undiscovered. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, right uh, now I think Gemma. I don't... Well, I have to name them. After. What's it? The uh, <laughs> yeah. corn ear. Yeah, the corn earworm. Yeah. yeah. That's. That's a it's common our worm one. of choice. The, in, the, it's a common uh, one. In the, the valley of the, Los Angeles. But it's not the only one, though. No? Gemma canna killer or something like that. <laughs> right. we'll, um, we'll, na we'll name the new discovery after Gemma. Or we'll so let her name it. When you're called in, is it, uh, is, is it, I would assume it's better for you to be working with grows like, from the get go. Yeah, so I do. I, I work not for a biocontrol. Brought in once there is a problem. Yeah. But is I'm that sure your that's, least favorite that's, time to come that's in? That's probably when you're. Well, I, I, I work. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. So that's a, that's a big message too. Um, yeah. So I work for a biocontrol company, right? We we sell insects for crop protection and other predators for crop protection, right? So um, in in our industry, it's it's all about vigilance because. If we rely on sprays and try to integrate a biological control program, you will struggle because some of those sprays will hurt the predators you've put into Like how, how are the Marone products? Um, I have some experience with them. They, um, they do say, I, I've attended some of their uh, presentations, some of their webinars, and they do say that they are softer on beneficials, but I personally haven't seen the research, so I don't know. So they're like, while well, this may do something to beneficials, uh, it uh, is not as bad as what it's doing to the thing you don't want. Yeah, and that's a it's a tough one. You got to say, okay, well, give give <laughs> me the mode of action. How is it behaving? Because, for example, um, BT Bacillus thuringiensis. If you told me, you know what, this is dangerous to your to the caterpillars, but it's not dangerous to aphid. That's absolutely true because the mode of action is only for caterpillars right? right so if we knew the mode of action of some of these other products sure. that claim that they are harmful to pests but not to the beneficials and we find that it made sense and there's some research and it made sense that they would they would hurt your pests and not your beneficials and you could say all right well you know there's something to this right. you know Tom I'm digging those uh, flavored waters uh, I, don't, I think we're out oh. oh she got more I don't know uh, Oh, I thought they were new purchases when they uh, showed up mysteriously in front of me. And I drank oh, both of them. Oh, did you already have one? Oh, I had two. Oh, they, they <laughs> must be in there. She just went to Costa. No, I didn't. Well. So you do, you take the, the video and then you do it, you edit out and everything, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, like a together. two camera. I mean, yeah. this is like, it actually, I mean, this camera, I think, overheated, but uh, like it's effective and it's budget, like, I can easily carry two iPhones around and uh -huh. two microphones and be like, I could actually do a cool conversation. Oh shit, yeah. that's the same worm and it'll or hit the same you, caterpillar. And it'll hit you at the, at, right at the same time, right about close to harvest. Is, is an inchworm season. a caterpillar? Yeah. Okay, it's just yeah. called inchworm. Yeah, they're, actually a, the, the more common name is uh, looper. Like, uh, and butterfly or moth? Butterflies and moths produce caterpillars. No, 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 an inchworm. Oh, um, it, a looper is a moth. Okay. Um, so even they look, they look cute and... See, they call them loopers because... Okay. Um, nice. Oh, yeah, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sorry, I drank your previous one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Should I turn this off? Are we done? You can turn that one off. This yeah. is... Uh, I guess this is a, they just call that a green looper. Yeah. It's yeah. Like the, 
so the common cute inchworm. So let's look up if you know. I'm pretty sure that that's corn earworm. It looks like many. So they, uh, uh, I took some macros of it, uh, but then it got away. <laughs> Um, here's here's what the away. adult looks like. Okay, it's a brown moth. Um, it's it's oh, not. Yeah. Tom, we should also know what the adult form looks like, so you don't kill <laughs> all the ones that aren't doing here's, any here's damage. Here's corn. Here's corn earworm. Um, one one. Damn. Yeah, right. that's it, definitely it's, a it's a no moth. noctuid. I think is a family noctuidy. This thing looks big. My noctuids yeah. can be very. It's not did you see any of these around, Tom? Let me see. That's what the adult looks like. It's a brown, tannish brown moth. You know, it's... Tom, be on the lookout for that one. Yeah, that thing is. Right. A... Okay, what size is it? You know, it looks kind of big. Again, I've. I, it's not a pest that I commonly battle. Uh, look at this. This wedge shape is like that's. It's a noctuid, right? I think it is. I didn't even know where to look for them. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what, you know, that is, what, that's the other place where that's we come in. Like I was, was sort of like, all I need was, was the knowledge, but yeah. we, never got, we never got there. No, like, I went, like, like for, for example, after I came two weeks ago, I'm bummed that, like, I didn't come five days later, because we would have started and, to uh, notice stuff. And, uh, <laughs> Here's a good photo. It's, it's, it shows you that kind of triangular yes, look. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they look that's very like that. Yeah. You got to look for things like the spotting on that's them, it. and, that's you know, true. you see this on the on the second wing, so there's two wings like that, so right? Is that male or female? I don't know. Oh, I'd have to look. But you see the brown. Oh, that's right. You see the second wing. You know how bu yep. butterflies have two wings. This bottom wing has that browning on the edge. Wow. That could be a big identifying feature. Well, what happens when it lands? Is it going to land? Some just generally any big moth take out. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't just, kill them. Just, don't just... kill them. Catch them. Catch them. Because we can ID them if you if you catch them on glue. Right, but once we me, ID it. Yeah, you, just you catch them on glue, put them in the ref put the glue in the refrigerator, and and a guy a guy um I work with a uh, another grower, a cannabis grower. He's indoor and out there up in Santa Cruz County. He um last time I visited him, he's like, hey um time you put the pin through it. I found I a bug. Onto the... He said I found a bug, a, a a weird red bug I'd never seen before, uh, at the base of one of my plants, and it it was just like. A hundred of them just at the base wow. and I said did you catch any he said yeah and he caught it but the mistake he made is he didn't put it in alcohol oh so it just shriveled uh, up to it like shriveled in the fridge at least he put it in the fridge so when I ID'd it luckily this bug is so distinctive it was easy to tell what it was and it was a bug called a bagrata bug which is common in coal crops and a problem in coal crops um, but he found it on his cannabis? On cannabis, so, okay. So is that coming? First sighting of Bagrata bug that I wow. know of, yeah. okay? But, And but when was this? It was on the base of the plant, and this... Did you see the base, like... The, the trunk of it, the very bottom okay. trunk, right? Oh. And and it it was a, a... What is it? You know, gathering there, but how could it be feeding on stuff such... Tough, tough tissue. I mean, hemp tissue is really strong, and this was a nymphal stage. This was just a nymph. Um, it had, oh, so it had, already it laid had not molded. To, and... No, it had not molted to an adult yet. Wow. It was in the process of molting, wow. um, so it didn't have its wings yet. You could tell it was a nymph. That's how you can ID that. I mean, look at it, you can tell. Okay, this looks like the second stage. Yeah, yeah, and you can you can ID them with their eggs. So, what could have happened is a bagrata bug from a local cabbage farm or some wild mustard out there. Uh, flew in, got confused, laid its eggs. Um, that's what could happen with that scale. Oh, and maybe won't eat the plant. No, I mean, it, it won't might be a problem at all. It, it. It, it's like it's yeah. like a whale that went up the river and then like couldn't figure out how to get back. Yeah, out it, that ocean. doesn't mean that we should block all rivers so the whales won't go in, right? Um, where's when's it a problem, right? It's uh, although I could see California doing that. <laughs> 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 Let's overregulate this. Let's wow. cripple really everybody. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. So. Yeah. Do most crops like they they like they do they lose a percentage to uh, 
to, to stuff like this. Like, do, do, do they I mean, have, that, like, an acceptable percentage yeah. of crop loss to... Yeah, so great. Specific, I mean, you're, you're, uh, hitting on, you're hitting on the subject that I like to talk about not, the We're most. asking good questions so that yeah. we're on fire. Yeah. So, okay. So, you know, obviously um, we have... We can see what pests can do, right? Um, they, they'll harm your... They harm your property and they harm your your yields and therefore your you know what you make what 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 you what you your come money up maker with. yeah right. so but what Tom shakes but 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 BT is not free right? right you have to pay for it so right. at what point is using BT a good idea right right all year long every you know from start to finish right. yeah you probably stand more chance of protecting from caterpillar if you do it that way but did you did you really make more money or did you throw it away in your material you use right, right? so there's there's what we call the co the concept of the economic injury level well, which is like well like first of all you have to figure that out so say you have so what is the cost of uh, of the bt for say you know i don't know Plant I'd have to I'd have to really look that up honestly. Or, or is it a per, like percentage wise? Like you're going okay, you know. I mean, is it in the single digit percentages that you're, you know? I mean, usually a lot of these soft materials are pretty inexpensive. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> but um, but again, you know, it's you put yeah, labor right. into it also. Yeah, labor. Cool. You know, you yeah. you put you you had to put labor into it. You. Um, there's all that involved in it, and, and um, that's why we've, we've developed this concept of the it, um, economic injury level, where at a certain point, it pays to do something. Right. Be, before that point, it doesn't pay to do something. So, okay, so th this is an extreme situation because everything here has been impacted by this, but you, but if, you, and this is not a commercial, but in a commercial, you certainly would, would not like, want this, which is why I asked about is, the, is there a percentage like that? Like it, there's a trade-off, but if but how does how does a farmer know what percentage of their crop they might lose to a situation like this before they have? To it's a very food? simple, solu very simple answer. Okay. Research, university research, okay. and how long have we been researching this crop at the university level? Now let's talk about other lucrative California crops. Let's talk about the top two: almonds and grapes. Right? Do they have guidelines? They actually do. You could get on, go online. There's resources available where they'll tell you if you have X amount of this pest per leaf after sampling 20 leaves in a 100 square foot area, then you must act. But before then, you don't. Get, see what I'm saying? Gotcha. We don't. We just don't know yet. So we don't know? have those. No. Uh, and the guidelines, guidelines for the crop are very can be very detailed. I mean, for grapes and uh, for grapes and uh, almonds, um, you know, they're they're fairly. Well, this is really interesting. Uh, what do you say? For other crops, there's guidelines. So if you see a certain percentage of pests um, in a certain uh, uh, area. area uh, then it's the, then it's a time to act, and those are very specific guidelines. It's 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 a it's a mathematical equation, but that none of those guidelines have been established for cannabis. Yet. Not yet. Not and that's uh, Tom, when I think we blew past the safe caterpillar yes. threshold. Well, there's no question that we did, but that's why I asked. It's like like this is just a home grow, but for a commercial, you wouldn't <laughs> want to lose your entire right. crop. And neither did we. Neither did we. So it's not all loss. You could, you could still. <laughs> yeah, we could still get that all you could pretty close. <laughs> you can get some live resin out of that. We can make some. But if we don't know how we have, which, is there still anything that's smokable? Like, would you make hash yeah, out of that? Sure. Yeah, you can make hash. Like, out like, of that. like ice water hash. Yeah. Like you would. Yeah, there's you would there's smoke trichomes it. on the leaves. There's yeah. you know. There's tons of tons of. But there's also a whole lot of botrytis, right? Yeah, but some you're fungal. filtering it. You're filtering it out, right? Your bags filter that out? Oh. A lot of it, um, not the spores. Okay, what, what do the spores do when you burn them? I don't and know. Inhale them? <laughs> I, I, would, I would venture I mean, to guess wanna, not much. You'd probably That's rather I've, have less Botrytis spores yeah, going into your it's, lungs it's not than I like more, right? Botrytis. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, if we're talking about Aspergillus. <laughs> it coats and, his lungs, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we're talking about Aspergillus mold, then. And don't forget yeah. it kills the Does Aspergillus grow on plants? 
de dying tissue, yeah. So, I, so you I can get guarantee it. you that if... I know, but that would be only... Like, you could eat it. It's just if you smoked or... Actually, no, the spores, inhaling the spores... Yeah, well, I mean, if you, if you think about it, you, you have a joint, right? And you light it, or pre-roll, you light it. That first puff isn't all burning smoke. There's some... Whatever spores were in there went right into your lungs. Alive. And they got shot right into your lungs. Nice. So... You know, but yeah, I mean, in a resin, you know, in a in a in a live resin, you're gonna do, go through all this purification. No, process. I know live resin. Yeah. I'm saying ice hash, water hash, ice water like hash, solventless. I couldn't tell you. I you know, dive into the research, botrytis, lung problems, and I'm sure someone's done something, but I haven't heard that it's prominent. Right. Um, all right. Well, let's. Uh, so I just realized that Gemma missed not only her three-hour Chinese class this uh -oh. morning, but she also just missed her uh, dance class too. Oh, is she happy of the, from that? She, she does the dance class uh, she, yeah, she, she, she hates. Want, she she hates it. Right yeah, now. so she wasn't going to remind Saturday, you. Like, she wasn't going to remind you. <laughs> four and a half hours of Zoom classes. Is she, is that, oh, so it's all online. The dance class too. Yeah, the dance class was, and I and I knew it was two forty-five, and I had texted her mom, being like, "What? Like, is there a Zoom link for her two forty-five oh class?" God. She's like. I'll check on the link. I think class is at 3.45. So I was like, oh, okay. And then I come back and yeah. like she forwarded something from the teacher that's like, we'll see you at 2.45. And it's now like 4.10. Well, you learned about corn earworm. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, you know. It was a good use of my time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my interest in this was like, really literally first of all doing it experiencing it but and then, then also, smoke it <laughs> you, well yeah i've been smoking it and all of that but like it was it's the home grow aspect it's yeah. trying you know it's trying to bypass having to go and pay all those taxes and to do all of that so mm -hmm. obviously there's risks and there's all of that and there's costs and there's time and there's there's all of that but and it's a learning process, but... Generally, there's sadness right now. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is not, you know, the outcome that you want. Right um, now, my, my dominant and feeling is sadness. Like a lot of other people who might, you know, like, and everyone's doing their gardening now. And, and, you know, there's a big argument for, like, people growing their own cannabis, especially if you need more, you know, if you want to, you know, if you're a patient and you want to do that. But you, you really got to get past this. It yeah. takes a while. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's yeah. a there's a learning curve. Yeah. Um, you just have to remember we've taken a plant from nature and have um, we have bred it for a certain characteristic, right? Production of cannabinoids and terpenes high in oils. Right. Um, well, <clears throat> there's a cost to that, right? There's a cost to that. It's the same as um, you know, like we've taken cows and. It used to be a wild animal that that used to have better defenses against predators, and nowadays we've you know we've created cows that are, entire life is intended you know they're just producing milk. So well, and, and, and they're a, also in like cow oh, cities. Oh, so we're, we're creating um, plants with less with fewer defenses. Potentially, mm -hmm. yeah. And if you look, if you compare indoor growing with outdoor growing, um, you know a lot of indoor grows you're you're further coddling the plant right mm, yeah. you're giving it everything it needs you're making right. it an indoor plant so now you've got a coddled <laughs> totally dependent baby mm -hmm. yeah 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 so that's often the why these these plants are more susceptible i mean there there's there's <laughs> i told my wife she's an indoor plant <laughs> it, yeah. she lives inside the brentwood bubble yeah i mean you can see or the difference like Jeff, all the way. <laughs> you can see the difference in indoor grown plants versus outdoor grown plants and their susceptibility to certain things. It's, you know, it's an artificial, these are cultivars that were artificially produced, right? Um, would they do as well if you put them back out in the wild? Probably not as well as their, you know, wild type relatives <laughs> out there, right? Run um, free, Chihuahua. Yeah, exactly. Also, we bred you to be tiny at, and helpless. At, at one point, that <laughs> Chihuahua was hunting rabbit. Right. And, you know. But also, they've been bred to have these extremely desirable characteristics. Yes. The look, the smell. And other creatures are equally as attracted. Or even that. better. I mean, more attracted. It's, uh, you know, there's, there's a, what's starting to, you know, like, come out of a lot of you know the growers that are paying attention is is you know the susceptibility of certain strains with certain 
terpene profiles. Mm, yeah. I think I mentioned this at the. Oh, you the mean last if it's video. high with one terpene, it would it potentially could attract a certain pest. It could, or a certain terpene profile represents a a, a plant that's more susceptible, not just to insect <laughs> it attack. It represents a female to the male moth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the breeze is picking up. I can totally smell that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, it's totally <laughs> we that. just don't know enough yet. That's just. It is it, interesting. Like like terpene profiles are kind of like frequencies and at different like yeah. for example the mod yeah. like our pheromones would, would like is it a smell which would imply it's a terpene they're, right? they're hormones they're actually hormones that you and i can't smell but the male moth can but does that imply that it does have a smell to to him or is okay. it a chemical that they just so it's, it's a pheromone it's, it's a pheromone yeah. so it's not a smell thing okay yeah. so it's not yeah. a terpene it's like it's but it's a it's in the same the way you think about terpenes with smell, a pheromone is to like a chemical yeah, trigger. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be that, but let's, let's keep in mind that a lot like of the these... chemical trail with the ants. So moths, for example. Let's okay. just think about moths. And, and, and what does the butterfly eat? Well, the, the adult, nectar and right. water. So would it make sense for, nectar, for um, adult flying moths and uh, butterflies, which are nectar feeders, to have the ability to smell flowers, yeah. nectar, yeah. find the nectar that I, way. I say yes. Right? But, okay. if, but, if, but if you put like a gallon of nectar in front of me, I would probably be well, able to well, smell but, it. Smell, but what, right? if they're not, what if they're not only focusing on nectar? What if they can smell terpenes that those flowers are producing? What yeah. And what if they also... prefer a certain plant that produces a certain flower that so, produces so you could in breeding cultivars which all kind of are going off and like the berries and the desserts and the whatever but like you, you may cross paths with some insect and you're and the insect's like holy shit that's my favorite that like smells good or maybe it smells like something that you really like so right. it smells like it i mean limonene what is limonene it's a terping that's in lemon in every can in cannabis right but it's it's prominent in in limes and uh, citrus fruit, citrus, right? right? It's a, it's one of the. I mean, it smells like limes. <laughs> That's why it's called limonene, right? It smells lemony, right? Um, could could that lemon smell be something that attracts a a a, a, a an, you know a, a a citrus pest to the citrus trees? We just don't know. Is it? It could be, right? Um, and if it is. Would more limonene attract them to, or a plant with more lime, that produces more limonene attract that same pest? I just, you know, it's and been then, a couple and of years. And then the idea that they taste a leaf that they've never tasted before and are like, I actually like this. Well, yeah, yeah, but this study is really important to crop management and all of that. So is this type of research being So get done? to it. So, okay, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm what in, are you doing sitting here with us getting high? <laughs> I'm, I'm not smoking. No, no this <laughs> um, is important. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is, I mean, okay, we work close with um, a lot of people that are in the research side of it. Right. Um, and, um, you know, So again, you mentioned Steve as one person. Steve would be one easy. Yeah, you know, give me, give me some other people. Um, well, you know, um, uh, we, we know uh, people at, you know, different universities that, that are entomologists. Like I would assume UC Davis is very strong. UC in Davis front. is strong. Um, are, there any, are there any like um, professors Cornell there? Cornell is also. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of these, these, these universities that, you know, we have some contacts there. I mean, um, there was um, the recent find of the cannabis aphid. We, uh, up until it, it came to Salinas, we weren't sure whether one specific species of a wasp was capable of parasitizing the aphid until we were actually you able put to put them together <laughs> until we were actually able to have some adult wasps emerge from a dead aphid and send it to an expert in that particular family of wasps in florida and they came back because there was no one in california who had that specific expertise that's or amazing. maybe that's the only person we knew who was yeah. an expert in braconid so they they um well i didn't know them but i was introduced to them we sent them the, the emerged adults and they came back and told us yes in fact it is this wasp that is commercially produced from us you probably heard about it the aphidius colmani wasp up until then we really weren't sure if colmani did do it so yeah, yeah the research is ongoing yeah. that's and that's when you guys were like we got a new bug we're gonna also, breed that's the type well, of research that well when they get it they'll spend a million dollars a day yeah on this type of research and, and that's what they'll do and then they'll knock it out i found this yesterday as well which is exciting um <laughs> you got all sorts of vials see that aphid right there it's black yeah. It's actually dead, and it, it could be. 
it could be that uh, it is one particular species of wasp that when it puts its egg in the aphid, the aphid oh. turns black. If it is, we might have another weapon. Uh, you, so you may see a wasp emerge from there, like in the next. That's day why or I two? collected it. That's what I wanted to do with the. That's what I want to do with this. I want to cut it out and look underneath to see what there is down there. With the, and with you're the like, scale. this may be a wasp that we don't currently have in our lineup. I suspect it's one it. that is commercially reared. Okay. So um, that, that's that, my suspicion. That's dead right there, right? That, that if it's dead, yeah. He's dead, but he's not dried up, and he's right. black. And actually, it looks like the cannabis aphid. It could be another aphid, um, but this grower had the cannabis aphid. This is about all they had. Um, and it doesn't look like the other black-colored aphid that I've seen um, attack cannabis. Is there something called the cannabis aphid? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we've been talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hemp aphid. Hemp aphid. Fordon. Fordon. Cannabis. Um, Are there any vials that you haven't pulled out and shown us? <laughs> well, I just, more? I keep these. I tell, I tell growers, give a handful of them to your crew. Have them yeah. carry them around sure. with you always. Catch it. So I, you, I can well, help you idea. Well, remember when we had it. the leaf hoppers? Yeah. I still have one at home. That's right. I could send you a Actually, I have a picture of it on my... Uh... Leaf hoppers are interesting. We were just talking about beet curly top virus, right? Yeah. Uh, last week. Um, now a reason to start really thinking about whether or not leaf hopper is going to be a, a pest of cannabis. Wow. Because it we is, had them. it's what transmits that virus. <laughs> but, wow. Yeah. And so by the way, we had virus? them too. That and that's when we had, we had like the praying mantis were like, what's up? This place is amazing. So you can imagine a situation uh, where a farm is infested with uh, the beet curly top virus. And uh, those, uh, that's being transmitted uh, within the farm by a, a, a leaf hopper. And that somebody decides to put a farm of, of hemp right like next door. Like in the door. same way that a mosquito transmits from got human. It. To, okay, got it. Got it. It's, it's exactly that. It's maybe the virus has been around forever and the, the leaf hopper has been around forever, but it wasn't until you put the virus yeah. that got into the yeah. plant that the leaf hopper was feeding on. Uh, you know what? I never posted a picture of it. I posted a picture of a different one I from home. <laughs> I, leaf this, hoppers this one was uh yeah um i was like you're kind of cute yeah there's a but now yeah that reminds me that i need to top? what was it called the... it's beet curly top virus it's uh it it, well it um <laughs> it, it makes the tops of beets curly oh, oh okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it, it was it was found in beets just like the um, name says i guess and that's where they came up with the name beet curly top virus we're very the top literal in the naming of uh pests uh, of yeah. insects and uh, pathogens toma tomato spotted wilt virus what right. do you think it does right right so but yeah that but it's not exclusive to beets it has other hosts um apparently now cannabis or hemp is a host nice look at this two of the same plain no. that thing's cool looks like it's made of wood it's probably it looks like a wood plane, right? For the wildfires, maybe? I don't know. No, that seems more like a vintage, like... Yeah. All right. Well, let's... Uh, that's a strong... Yes. Yeah. Strong ending. Tom's mind's blown. He has a lot to think about. Between like this I told season you, and the next like season, said, we'll develop a game really plan. Right? Well, hey, you, you know. know. I, I didn't know you at we'll the start. Take this, we'll take this disease. Like, now you I know him intimately. Do you feel like that? Kind of like... Uh, like you get to come and intimately I mean, evaluate like, people's gardens, you. like their grow operations. Essentially, yeah, that's my I, job. They're basically burying themselves I let him up know to you in a way. That's why I don't mention names of people I work with, right? <laughs> I don't want to tell anyone where, who, where, who I might be selling bugs to. So you this know? specific grower had this disease. Yeah, this that's season. the way you gotta it was do it. Terrible. This, yeah, this grower in Salinas. I wouldn't, buy, I wouldn't buy their weed in a shop. Yeah, exactly. It's like no, that's a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, th there's no reason to, to mention anyone. <laughs> Throw them under the bus. Yeah, but everyone has them. I mean, everyone. Well, yeah, Tom, you're you burying know, everyone yourself has to yeah. thousands of people right now, so you're very brave. Yeah, I mean, but then again, there's a, there's a reason for this, right? You're learning. You learn some. Right. You know, now you have one more strategy. But hey, you know, 
we didn't know each other. We Tom, met, to, we we are, met we today. We are sacrificing you to teach is, others. For mm -hmm. the, the perspective, like my perspective, it will always be a non-commercial perspective. Yeah. That's not what this is about. So, you know, so everything is considered from a home grow point of view. It's yeah. the cost, what I'm going to do, how can I protect this? And that doesn't mean the grief isn't, you know, the isn't same. real. You know, in the sense of, of the loss grief is real. and the time and all of that. But, you know, whether that changes your decisions, maybe not, because the, the lessons are still the same. You know, uh, you have to, you have to be vigilant from the beginning. Yeah. You, the question for me has always been, is there something I can do even before all of this? Oh, yeah. To, like, yeah. preventative, you know? Yeah, what, <clears throat> so I'm not a biocontrol specialist, although I, I know a bit about biocontrol. I'm an IPM specialist, and that right. stands for Integrated Pest Management, the keyword's integrated. It means one, not one strategy. Like one of my profs used to say, all right, if you had a boxer come out, if you had Mike Tyson come out and all he knew how to do was throw an uppercut, it wouldn't take long before his, his, his fighter knew the fight. Although his, that his is opponent. the killer punch and punch out. It is his killer punch, but, he, but he's also throwing everything else at you. So but if like all left, he did... Is that the one where it's like left, left, right, right? I, I never played. I never played it. And I, I think I did once and, and he killed me like in the first round and then I stopped. But... Um, but let's say all he did was come out with an uppercut and he just like wound himself up soon you'd know how to how to defeat him right it's the same idea you got to use everything you got to use right crosses jabs <laughs> the pests are like we saw that strategy last year you're not going to fool us again yeah you just have to throw everything at him so there's so there's all kinds of it's not just about when we talk about pesticides and when we talk about biological control we're talking about one arm one strategy in ipm that's the eradication strategy. That's kill it. That's the last thing you do, believe it or not. That's, a, right. that's like your last straw, kill it. Right. You know, you have things like keep them out of the grow. How do you do that? Or right. under control. Select, right. select strains that are more resistant, right? right? How, what about hitting their life cycle? Something that, you know, the disease triangle. We talked about right. that. Right. Yeah, you can think of strategies. Right off the bat, we talked about right. strategies. Right. If you control the... If you control the caterpillar, you make it less susceptible to the disease because there's less injury, right? So there's all these, it's a myriad. Tom's gonna become a black belt in the understanding of the disease triangle. Well, it, you know, it takes a lot of reading and time, and, and, but to think, think about it, but you know, that's kind of my job is, you know, design a program that is, you know, more bio-intensive. In other words, trying to work around biocontrol so that we can reduce or eliminate sprays but at the same time integrate as many strategies as I can think of. And it also, again, coming back, if you're dealing with commercial grows, these are grows that will have different strains in, in, in different you know, seasons and all of that. So, but I assume that what they don't want is to have to fight the same battle year after year or face, I mean, I guess th this is just the challenge of ag agriculture anyway, mm -hmm. right? right? Yeah. yeah, yep. So, um, it just seems that, that, that cannabis in particular, which is now only now really starting to scale up, is dealing with these issues on a yep. truly commercial scale. You got it. And um, there are things we're doing that are good, and there are probably more things we're doing that are bad. It's, um, it took a couple of years before the cannabis safe had really became a problem in Salinas from when I first Was heard it on it a different plant? Like, do people know, mm -hmm. like, it came from oh, this or just came so out of nowhere? No, it's a. Uh, um, I mean, obviously, um, the well, name we, implies that it's We talked that it a bit about cannabis. it uh, on that uh, last Sunday, right? right. Remember? But I wasn't um, paying total it's, attention it's a, it, the whole time. Foridon, the, <laughs> the aphid. Totally honest. <laughs> the aphid's a ge in the genus Foridon, and it has a relative that's very closely related to it, which is the hops aphid. Right. Hops and hemp are related, so that pests that feed on them happen to also be related. So is it, is it outside the realm of possibility that the hops aphid can host on cannabis and vice versa? Is it outside? Or that like it did a Neanderthal, like diverging to, what are we, hominid, what are we? We're hominids. Hominids. Neanderthal um, was a hominid too. But, but it, but we're not Neanderthals. So my no, point is, my that's point is species, like, do, do you yeah. think maybe in a short period of time, the hop aphid like, like diverged, like, well, they no, they're, 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 they are clearly different species, right? We don't know. And we but don't do you think have at evidence. One point, like a million years ago, or even a thousand, like 
because bugs recycle like they they have so many cycles yeah. in, in the in a year versus us i don't right? know how many forodon aphid there are out there but it is a family of aphid and so they're they're related in some of their d genetics. D d and, didn't they you know. recently find um, like amber of, and I want to say something like a, an it was a fly, or, wasn't it? With did the, you see with something the giant in the news sperm? in the past? Of of what? I think it was a fly. Of an insect, right? Wasn't it a fly? It was the sperm of an insect, right? And it was. I think it was still stuck to the female. I think she. <laughs> I think the. <laughs> So does that, that mean that they could, does that <laughs> she mean she was they, inseminated and but what and does it, that mean? Could they recreate that fly like in vitro? I, I, at this point, the technology is not there yet. As far as I know, you know, um, oh, sure, it's there. like a, a prehistoric yeah. fly. Yeah, it was here. It's yeah. probably like this big. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, it's, like a it's, cow it's sperm is it possible that the hop safe can can is it, is it possible that the hops aphid can bring hops latent vira to cannabis well definitely because basically if you like beer you like weed <laughs> and everybody by the way this is our tom's expert opinion <laughs> <laughs> what about those of us who like disclaimer wine? Do you know, well <laughs> tom is know. not an expert you can like weed too you can like weed too right? yeah beer yeah. and buds and yeah, weed yeah. and wine if i liked hot yeah if I, I do like beer and i do like weed so yeah, so I am like the so, aphid. The, but the cannabis aphids known only to host on um, on the cannabis. Although you know, the, it, it obviously has to follow some some somewhat of the life life cycle of like the hop aphid, which goes which hosts between cannabis and uh, um, stone fruit, but you're prunus saying, prunus species. Okay, but sorry, before cannabis was around, the hop aphid was going. Obviously, hops are grown all over. I mean, not all over, but like. Where, what's the other one? Dragon what? Uh, the, the, you're talking about the trees? Uh, the, no, 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 you, the stone you mentioned fruit? another, yeah, stone, stone fruit. fruit, sorry, yeah, not prunes, dragon. Like prunes and peaches and all that. Okay, um, that's the definition and of And it hosts on, on both, yeah, because it's got the. So when there are no hops fields around, it's like all hang out on the peaches you and You know, I, it's, and... I still don't understand it, although I do know that it will, can overwinter, basically feed, and actually also, you know, believe it can, it can, you know, reproduce on prunus, uh, you know, like the, the stone fruit and then back to hemp or hops. You know, we, I'm, I'm not sure about this aphid, whether, whether eliminating, and there is no aphid yet, but eliminating all the prunus trees in the area will just break its ability to overwinter and then help with control. I, I don't know. So oh, because so hops die at the end of the season and those trees linger yeah. on this is so and it's in temperate climate. Like, do, do those trees, mo like, let's say, I assume they grow well in, like, the central coast. Uh -huh. Do they lose their leaves in the winter, or are they just going full year? You know, it's, um, it's, it's even just, it doesn't necessarily have to feed on leaves, right? It could be feeding on, on branch tissue or something. You know, I don't, so a lot of aphids, when they overwinter, will overwinter on a naked tree that's, you know, in, in the bark or, you know. Um, how, how about in cold environments? Like, I grew up in New England. Yeah, I mean, because here it's like look, you if could you survive make, all year long in LA. Where, where as did an insect. prune where did prune trees come from originally? I, you know, I haven't researched it, but um, at some point they Millions. bred them to <laughs> grow like in different in, climates, right? Uh, in Iran, so they were bred to grow in different climates, and that, you know, if there could be you know there could be a prune that grows here, a prune of species that grows here that doesn't back east, and vice versa. Yeah, this is very interesting. I mean, I think, have you dealt with a lot of uh, any of these large grows where the farmers transitioned over to hemp from other crops? And so, you yeah. know, so, you know, because we've been hearing about this for, for years, you know, large grows, and a well, lot of them didn't make it. They kind of didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what they were going to do with their crops after they harvested them. But now there's this other component. Were the, did they know what pests they were up against with this, with these brand new crops and, and, and all of that? Yeah, yeah no, you, you, to grow something completely new, there's yeah. definitely, I, I mean, the, the blueberry farmer up, I think, in Washington State, uh, I talked to a couple months ago, he then grew hemp at scale and he was like my first season with, and he's like a world-class blueberry farmer um and he was like it just slapped me around yeah um, i mean if you're not ready for it, it you know it's like anyone you know there's a there's a uh, a learning curve for every crop everything. 
There are some like, easy crops to grow. You but know? how would you like go away from a crop you know, blueberry, you go, oh, here's this new one, I'm gonna make a killing. And you know, I, I don't understand the mentality because here's like a smart person. How could you not even, how could you do that and not do your bottom line research? You know, I, I, <laughs> <That's>, I, <laughs> Again, there's yes. the bottom line research isn't there. Um, you have to remember. And then if it's not there, then you're taking a real challenge. Yeah. A real challenge. Well, it's and, like and all the people who are growing hemp, and then we're like, shit, I have nowhere to store all this stuff once exactly, I cut it that's down. That's what we were saying. They didn't. They didn't know how, where they're going to store it. They didn't know how to cure it. They didn't know how to then manufacture it. You have to dry and, and cure this it. if you mm -hmm. want to sell how, the flower. Why would you make that investment if you don't know? Your could it be? Plant? Could it be that? Um, the investor for the cannabis operation is a different animal altogether. Could it be that somebody that wants to switch, let's say, from ornamental flower production to cannabis? Well, um, no, but is we're, one... here, here we're talking about the people who are doing hemp farms at scale, uh -huh. like not cannabis, but like well, the same hemp same deal. Yeah, same um, kind of but, same, but it's same at deal. such a bigger scale of like yeah. what you've never done this before and you haven't thought out like and you well, didn't bring someone in who knows what I'm they're doing. Them. Yeah. But but see, so that's what I was getting at is you have it, it, the chance of success for somebody that has grown another crop and has done it for years and understands everything that goes into the business of farming. Having success with hemp, I think, is greater than, you know, some somebody that's just investing to try to. Oh, 100 percent, which right? is a lot of cannabis. So, operations. Which is a lot of cannabis right. and but, and a lot of hemp. I mean, if you what I'm hearing from you is that there's a body of knowledge unique to every different thing that you grow that, you know, if you're not uh -huh. aware of it, it'll bite, you know. Yeah, take absolutely. On the pest side, <laughs> I, I tend, I focus on cannabis. I've, I've had, a, what, three years now, just almost exclusively focusing on this crop because it's a new crop. And so, you know, it's like I am, I am learning more and more about, you know, different indoor outdoor greenhouse uh you know environments, environments yeah. pest compasses different different states and their pests so your learning curve is like my so learning curve is like that yeah so that's so that's kind of my goal is focus on this niche um i know i couldn't tell you anything about plant nutrition you know other than what a basic bo a botany class or plant physiology class taught me you know, but, but going forward, that would probably be really helpful to you because oh, how sure. could that not like, yeah. you know, when you're talking about. Well, don't get me wrong. I mean, I do know I, that, I did take yeah. I mean, aphid aphid is known to yeah. blow up and uh, yeah. plants are, are excessively, you know, they have excessive nitrogen. Right. Exactly. Right. So. Yeah. So the, why wouldn't that apply to this? I, we're, I don't know if we're sure about that yet, right. but it's something I follow, right. you know, and we, we, right. we definitely, you know, you can't get you can't get into agricultural pest management without knowing something about plant physiology. You know? yeah. Whoa. yeah, because of those, because yeah. those relationships are. But I would never jump into growing. Let's put it that way. I'm not <laughs> I, I, I would land. Flat. I could probably protect the plant, but it would be a spindly, you know, weak plant, low yield. <laughs> <laughs> but it'd survive. Unlike yeah. Tom's. It might be pest free. Yeah, robust, Amid, yeah, robustos robust. that then. Yeah. Well, right. I'm still letting them go. It's so funny because even some of these back there, it's sort of like they have a will to live. Well, keep in mind if there is a disease there, you're harboring that, you know, potentially harboring botrytis. So all that dead tissue, when, when you get it, you want to you wanna clean up. Yeah. You're going to want to clean that whole area, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, burn it strawberry growers like i was telling you they pick up the, the strawberries and <laughs> tom bury torch, them far torch from the, the backyard field. yeah yeah they clean up get rid of them get them far away yeah it's uh, because you've you've at, you've uh, <clears throat> you basically have a propagule something that can uh, come back to life once it has a susceptible host oh. right right and a, and the and the environment and then these the, will host tie needs. up and become like a like airborne, like spore life, right? Totally. And if botrytis is a problem in tomatoes and yeah. you have those there, yeah, or yeah. if it's, you know, a problem in any one of these <laughs> other crops of yours, which it's, this one it looks has like a, a poo host. with leaves uh, coming yeah, out of so. it. <laughs> it looks like a poo with leaves coming out of it. <laughs> yeah, you, you, um, you know, you, if you have spores that landed on your lawn there and you watered with a sprinkler and this is one way that spores can move from plant to plant. Oh. The, the drops of water we hit gone. the ground, oh. pick up the spores and splash onto 
the growing bed and then it happens again and or the wind dries that spore now that it's gotten closer to the plant and the spore flies up and lands let's say on a pistil as it's just beginning to show signs of like the flower primordia right, right. that's all you need that spores yeah. there that's and right. that that's could be that's the, exactly what happened it could be the death of i of, watched it happen it was like i knew it was <laughs> happening because it's like it, you know you can see it happening it's obvious but I didn't know, I mean, there's nothing I could do to prevent it. I didn't know, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, it was so fast, literally within a few days. And also, I'm like, I, I need, I, rather than go in and do that, I'm like, all right, this is the first one, I know what's happening, but I need, I wanna have someone come here, you know. That's what we're gonna do. This. So that's why I-, I Tom, we're setting up next well, season. I think, I think it's I, the I, plan. I go in and rip everything, you know, like all the brown, because I, I bent that with a few of them and there's nothing left. Yeah, there's a chance that if you had harvested this last week, gotten rid of all the dead dry brown and yeah. got, got in on maybe some kind of really aggressive drying of everything else, yeah. Yeah. that you'd have saved half of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, that's, uh, I think once Peter and I met, that was kind of the, the idea is if I become part of this thing, you know, I'll be around next year yeah, or yeah. next time. He lives in LA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, to, to, to see what we could do to, you know, do our well, best to protect. It's so interesting because, <laughs> you know, there's this other thing. We need Eric Nugshot to come. Uh... I'm so, like, such an advocate <laughs> for home grows. I've had this idea come admire for a this long for the camera. time, like, you know, like, tending to people, you know. I, that's why that was another part of this. Like, let's see if we can, and we have an indoor thing here. Can we... Uh, successfully do some home grows oh no doubt and then i thought well you know take 10 them for people you know um and i think that actually with 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 cannabis um you know I, people should want their home grows but it's a lot of work i'm realizing it's really a lot of work because you know you almost uh, have to have daily eyeballs on them no. and um i was wasn't really aware of that and even something as small as this it's like you know I catching like seeing like catching that it's it, it's work it's work like you you know and I, and I even got one of these uh, or like this just so I can get in real close nice you know, in there um, I still didn't catch all of them but that's what it takes so it does so. and there are all kinds of tools for it and um, you know if you if you know me long enough you'll know. I'm a pre. I preach monitoring. I preach. Yeah. Um, it's it's. You preach mono what? Monitoring. Oh, um, monitoring. Yeah. If you don't spend the labor resources on monitoring, um, you could end up with, you know, a really bad situation quick. Yeah. And um, really quick. Yeah. <laughs> like within two weeks. No, when I was even, last year. No, even even more than that because when I I let him know right away what was going yes, on water. and he has the text it was it was and i was like i think i've lost the whole thing yeah I and think that I was said. that was a week and a half ago easily i go I, i'm pretty sure this entire thing is gone because i saw what was happening and that was a week and a yeah half i was ago. in rhode island yeah yeah that it, that that, that hot event could have also been something to do with it right although the, the, yes. the heavy presence of, of <laughs> so herbs. when he texted me that my response was Keep an eye on the other buds, look into them with a knife and eyes to see if you can find any caterpillars, like pry, yeah, pry yeah. them apart, like look closely to see if there are any caterpillars yeah. in there. Well, now you look, know to look for the poop and the feeding, yeah, the leaf right. feeding damage, yeah. right? But clearly, once you start you, you, seeing you know what, you matter, need to, you, you, have, need, you, you know, you yeah. need to you train your dog ones, on right? that smell and then have her bark <laughs> <laughs> when she smells it. That specific worm poo. Maybe I mean, a uh, caterpillar poo. Maybe the cats will be better suited to him. That's, right, a, that's well, an interesting idea, using dogs. Yeah. Dogs <laughs> for scouting. Yeah. Your pests. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. I got to go home and cook dinner, but yeah. uh, this was awesome. This was Ooh. fabulous. Strong work team. But, yeah, Tom, you, really, you really are helpful. like... Uh, Jesus sacrificing himself for the good of other home growers everywhere. I'm a home grow martyr. There's a home, a home grow <laughs> right. But 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 
He rose and from the dead. And next year we'll bring some new diseases and plagues well, I tell you, to attack your it's, plants. It's so demoralizing because that feeling like oh, two weeks ago <laughs> when I was like, you know, because I've, I've gone that's, into that's a million That's when your hopes were at their I've, highest. I've been to a million and it's two like, weeks ago. And, and I go, oh my God, I have these, and, and just not even, because I don't like touching them, but, and so, like so sticky and I'm like, oh my God. I made this happen because I've been taking so much good care of them and I'm like, and so that feeling was beyond if you're a cannabis lover and go, and because that's how they were. It's like I, I wouldn't even touch them and my fingers would come away. I'm not even touching them. And contrast that with your current feeling. So how, how, how long <laughs> well, have you well, been well, growing? Here's, here's the thing. I, this is my first. Yeah, so you just have to talk to a few cannabis growers and ask them the messes they've had to deal with. Oh, yeah, no, I, I already know. Yeah. I mean, I know. I mean, I know that this There's is... There's a learning curve. Yeah, no, I, there's always a learning curve. I know this loss is, is relative. And all I'm saying is, like, that coming from that feeling down to the other one, you really have to do a little work to, to, to revisit that, you know, to jump back in and go, okay. But... Um, but like all the growers I've talked to, you know, who've done it, they're like, you know, you know, well, your plants die, you know, yeah. they die, you know, they, yep. you know, uh, and then you grow new ones and it's the cycle of life and, you know, and, yep. uh, but, Tom, you're so but like here's the other thing, he brought these things over, the experience. See, even, even the one on the left, just like, I didn't think he was going to make it. It was like sickly, it was nothing. And it's like every day. I'm, so they're like little babies and mm. nursing them back. And it became this beautiful little plant only then to He's die. He's bonded with them. I have bonded with them. Mm -hmm. I have. It's sad. I know. Yeah. yeah. I've, um, but here's the other thing. The these were also the designed. It's not a, a, it's not living soil. It's like, but, but, and we, everything was according to uh, these guys, you know, Organics Alive, great guys. Well, you you're, know, you're, um, their, their thing. the caterpillar just, uh, yeah, the, the, just, no, no, it just ignored all of that. it, ignored it. It's, it's, it's life that came, so it's sort of like finding the balance, you yeah. know. I don't want to kill the caterpillar if I don't want to. No, well, we're, we're, we're going to, basically these beds yeah. over the winter, we can uh, build up. And, and the beds, I just get some worms in there. In Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. The only cover crops. living soil grow, I think, in all of Las Vegas, in the first one. Beautiful farm. This is Steve Cantwell. Steve Cantwell. Do you know who he is? He was a <laughs> Martin mixed okay. martial arts champion. Now he's got this grow. It's this. Now he's an people. indoor living That's soil. That's his product right there. At he's scale in grow. And he uses these beds, right? Mm -hmm. And it's all, I mean, they're just, it's so, it's indoor. You know, to, it's controlled mm -hmm. environment. Brushing you get dressed in your little booties, all of that this stuff. This is when you his go weed. In. This is his weed. The banana man. Really cool guy. And, um, you know, um, so, that, you know, we're just, I'm going, going for, for uh, an, a living organic environment. That was the idea. So when here. you come back yeah. next year, Tom's going to have so a, a in, four in by that, 60 bed in, in, out here. Along those lines, he was at his 22nd, yeah. I think, cultivation in that, in that same soil. And so he's supposed to get richer richer as it goes on 22 is a lot yeah that's like mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. you know it's, it's really i think four and it's a half, craft exact, it's a right? science and an was art. it like it was four and a half five. over five i think uh i think we did the math might have been four and a half it's on the tape right yeah so. yeah it's <laughs> yeah. it's all really it's look a at the science tape. um and it's an art um you know people have to have worked with a crop and a sp specific growing system to really figure out how to make it work. Some people are gifted. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and the, it's not easy. Everything was consistent, which is always impressive mm -hmm. to go and see the, the plants. Everything was a beautiful grow, not even terribly large. And he has his hands on everything, this guy, who was a mixed martial arts guy, and now, and his knowledge is so he's totally into it. And so that was basically the question, because everything he produces, he sells, right? He's got a sweet little small business. But everyone wants to Tom, get bigger. We're, we're not selling any of this. No, 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 none of this. Is. But how do you get bigger and maintain quality control? Maybe so go slow. Go Maybe slow. go slow. That's his, that's his I've demo. seen, I've Still seen insane. so, I've seen so many people fall flat on their face, just biting off more than they could chew. Um, and but, if you're making it with a small business, if you're paying your people, you're making some money. What's wrong with that? Right. That's why people go to um, and, and major in, in, and get degrees in agricultural business because 
you know, that teaches you how to do that, how to yeah. start a farm yeah. and make it successful yeah. and, 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 and grow and, and eventually become yeah. rich from it, yeah. you know, but yeah. you, you, you jump into it without really knowing what's involved, you, you, you've kind of, you've set yourself up, you know. Um, well, I mean, what'd be interesting, I'm, and I think, you know, it's interesting to know at, at what point, you know, in cannabis scaling up, does it become like a, a real, like a real different type of product, you know, and, and you know, less, you know. When is it? Let's cross the Budweiser yeah. threshold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, give us give us another five years. We'll know a lot more. Exactly. All right. You don't so want let this, me, uh, right? You don't want any of that. No, that's done. I, I got what I needed. Ugh. So, yeah, let me grab that. What about, the, what are these specimens doing here? What was, that was, <laughs> no. was uh, that was Gemma? Gemma? That was Gemma was, uh, yeah. feed, there, oh my God, Speak on cue. Gemma was feeding the caterpillar, yeah, but then it got loose. Now. We're going right now, baby girl. No, I want to leave in 10 minutes. No, Gemma, oh we've got to leave now, Gemma. and let's go cook some dinner and look at our plants at home. Pool. You can, if we get back quick, you can go in the pool. That's your incentive to want to leave quickly, because we got to leave quickly. When something we have to do aligns with what you want to do, amazing things happen. Did you ask Ryan about the little leather pouches? No, no, that's the leather pouches. What's Where were it? they? Th they were in the bag. <laughs> they were there? Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, actually, I was like, thank God. Oh, my God, thank God. I, ch I thought I checked in there. They must have been shoved somewhere. Okay, excellent. Gemma, we had some amazing conversation out here that you missed. But Gemma, we decided some things you're going to get really good at. Where'd you go? You're going to become our caterpillar uh, identifier. You're going to be like our patrol, like on the, uh, what's the north uh, wall in, uh, in Game of Thrones? What do they call it? Uh, I never watched the show. I don't know. Uh, Wait, I get, I get what you're saying. Uh, a century? Yeah. I never, I only watched the sex scene. <laughs> <laughs> Gemma, the glasses, Mike. Okay, did you don't. Bring these over for the babies? I did. I need some. some, I, uh, some uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you I'll, didn't bring any, did you? No, I assumed you had. No, all right, so there's. All right. All I have all is right. this. Can you. Um, totally out. Baby girl. And so I was trying to save this plant, my, the gardener. It's a totally different. This plant over here. He mm. brought it to me. The gardener brought that? Yes. Like from his house? Yeah. Uh, Tom, so, <laughs> that's like a vector of in fact, he's, yeah. it probably has like mites and yeah, that's a, that's it's like a spider a... mite. And to, actually, I would love for you to look at that right now and be like, dude, this has all sorts of stuff you don't want to be introducing. Wait, so the gardener was well, like, he, he edited all this. <laughs> what is that? that is over here. This all looks like. Well, that looks like dirt, actually. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's a totally different. Story. So he was still, like, it's flowering already. But he was like, you're growing weed, I'm growing some weed at he home goes, too. He goes, it's not doing it really well. And he had it in terrible soil. And I, so I put it into this and put some better dirt in there. Tom, you are some... such a caregiver to these plants. Well, I wanted to try to help it. him, but I think I'm going to give it. it back to him. It's doing okay, but I couldn't mess with the roots, so I couldn't mess with his original. He just had, it was just shitty. It was really... <laughs> dense and you know do you see any like spider mites oh I, was, I wasn't even looking for that <laughs> um, was do you know what was he growing inside or outside he, or I don't, he didn't tell me I mean he and have you been keeping it <laughs> in the shade the entire time no okay. no but but it started to I know, like sorry, it was, you had it over there right? it was yeah it was burning it looked like it was burning a little bit so I took it out of the sun but it's been getting plenty of sun right rot in there what? What's that? There's definitely rot in there. Nice. <laughs> not we're, nice. We're, Tom, we're not the only ones. It just got here? Just got here. <laughs> Tom, Tom, you are like the grim reaper for well, yeah. weed plants. But this was, it, was, it wasn't doing <laughs> this is, this is They're like, I don't want to go to dirt. Tom's house. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why not harvest it? <laughs> yes, baby girl. You can, you can see that. Oh, oh my God. You're, you're taking yeah. food to go? Yeah. yeah. My God. She gave it to you or you just took it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
get. Yeah. Get it uh, ground up. I mean, these do look like a little bit like turds, but no, I think this is just dirt. Yeah, now we're finding them left and right. So yeah. show me how many. Uh, <laughs> This is probably in about one minute. You about a found minute of scouting. How many are in there? I don't know. I like lost count. 10? Probably ten. Yeah, and, and it just took about a minute. So, I mean, we've yet to see one bud here that doesn't have the poop in it. So. All right. So basically, in better non-blinding light, we're finding tons of caterpillar. Well, they they they're probably gonna hide when it's hot, right? Right. Um. So uh, now that it's cooling off, they're coming out to feed. They might, they might be more likely to come out and start <laughs> chewing be on social. other green parts. Meat. Yeah, I mean, if there is botrytis here, that's I, I'm that's totally more true. and more convinced. Convinced it's, it's not the real problem. The problem was all this okay. feeding. You so just we have predominantly a caterpillar infestation that yeah, is now that havoc, you look once you can on look close plant. you know then you can you'll find them and uh, I mean that's that's a lot for like a minute of scouting right yeah, yeah. this is uh, but the turds give it away interesting that the leaves weren't focused on they just came at the right time the moth laid the eggs at the right time Oh, so sometimes they lay their eggs much earlier and then you start to, that, I mean, you see like it. a lot more of this. Yeah, I mean, you see, normally what I see is a lot of leaf chewing damage, which leads you to the area where you, like this here, which, which leads you to where to look for them, you know. So, um, okay, I see that leaf chewed, I see that leaf chewed there. There's got to be a caterpillar here, I look. But normally, where you don't see leaf chewing, you don't expect them to be there, so... I'm wondering if what happened, they, they hatched by the time there was significant amount of flower tissue and started feeding, unbeknownst to Tom. And um, <laughs> by the time you got to this stage, they were everywhere. Right. They were just hiding. Here's one. <laughs> See, it's a... Uh... Well, I mean, I have had people out here who were more knowledgeable than me, but... They didn't when see I, that I think when we saw that first one, it was kind of like the early days of them no, coming to the party. No, but that is exactly when I would have started. I mean, if I'd known. Yes. But you know what? There, um, Peter does make a very important point: is when you scout is important. I, I tend to like cooler part of the morning for scouting, no, for, for exactly right this reason. It, when yeah. we first came out here, it was nothing like this, and now we're seeing them. I mean, I'm picking them out of practically one hand, every flower. One-handed. <laughs> Yeah, so they got you good, but you'll be ready next year. That's right. Shake yeah. it off, Tom. <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring Gemma home. I've, actually, I've already shaken it off. This has been... Uh, I mean, the thing is, is like, you just need to know. I could... Ba I, I could... That, that is... You, you can... I could deal with that. I can... Uh, I'm you okay something. dealing with, with caterpillars next time. And yeah, look at I this. Know what it <laughs> look at this. Found one? Uh, Why not? Just like the... The turds. Yeah, knowledge is power, right? Absolutely. I'm not scared of that. So we know the strategy well, next what year. What scares me is not knowing. Good thing is so far, it's just been that corn ear one. It's like miniature rabbit pellets. All right. Cool. I'll All leave right. you guys to... You guys are like uh, gorillas grooming the plant. Well, uh, <laughs> the plant. Two, four, six. Out. 8, 10, 12, 13, 14. Here, show it to me sideways. Oh. Wow. A lot of unhappy caterpillars and alcohol. So you'll basically ID these and be like, they're all the same thing. It, it looks like it's all the same caterpillar. Right, that's crazy. Okie dokie. All right. It's hard to walk away. <laughs> 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 it's like... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, when did we find the last Easter egg? We don't that know. That is really funny. So, young, a very young larva there. Brownish, yellowish brown, all the way to this big fat green one. But it's all the same. Appears to be all the same Did you get that species. from one thing? That was, that Gemma, was three Gemma, we buds. have some more caterpillar you for you. Dig. You have to dig in there and you'll find them. So, Gemma. more than likely, if, if you find this many. Oh, here's one. <laughs> I forgot that one. 
Oh, that one's a baby. And they're all the same species? Okay, so that is the uh, corn ear. Yeah, that's what it looks like corn. to me. I'm like I said. Oh, no, I'm what not is an the expert. corner? It's, corn it's, ear it's the striping that that um, I showed you the photo. Yeah. Okay, you know, I'll show you the two stripes that go down. It's it's back. Is uh. Do you want to get those in here? 